start with the roll call. All members are present except Councillor Singh, who's here on behalf of Mayor Brown, who won the lottery this week. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> who's away on other municipal business, but congratulations to our Brampton friend that apparently did win the big number, so good for them. Councillor Carlson is here. Mayor Crombie away on a personal matter. Uh, Councillor Demerla away on a personal matter. Councillors Dasko, Dylan Downey are here. Councillor Fonseca's advice she will be late. Councillor Kovacs is here. Uh, Councillor Mahoney is here. M Councillor McFadden on the matter that we're aware of. And all other members are here except Councillor Sato, who is away on a personal matter. Uh, before we begin, you know, it's a privilege to have the job that you've bestowed upon me, and I get many privileges because of it, but it's not without its um, more dour moments, and this is one of them where I, I was asked this morning to decide whether we would lower the flag with regards to International Ukrainian Flight 752, and I, of course, said on behalf of Council we would do so immediately, and we've done so. Uh, what a tragedy that touches us all in Canada, and I was particularly more despondent to learn that it touched us right here in Peel because a family in Caledon East lost two members as well. Uh, like my good friend Councillor Carlson, I'm a, I'm a bit of a student of world history, and when we talk about this part of the world, and I, I love the word Iran, but I remember it as Persia when I was studying as a younger man in that part of the world, once part of the umbrella that we would have called Persia, and all much they've given to the world and culture, and between Persia and Syria and Iraq, it really is the cradle of civilization. It's where the Tigris and Euphrates river system met. You remember studying that in history at school? First, uh, first grapevines in the world were found there. And we're proud of places like Rome that have been around 2,500 years. Aleppo's been around 7,000, all from this cradle of civilization. And then you look at the people that we lost. I'm sure it's touched them. All the morning papers had the first five. The caliber of Canadians that we lost of Iranian descent and what they contribute to our society, and young and in the brim of their lives and accomplished and scholars and, and giving to the community. It really is a great, great tragedy. So on behalf of a regional council, um, and quite sadly, we extend our condolences to all the families and the loved ones and, and hope we can all get through this. And from that, you, you turn to some great joys that you get in this job as well. You recall when I was um, elected a year ago, one of the questions that I asked was, we, like so many of our other entities, don't have the traditional ceremony acknowledging our indigenous lands and our indigenous people, so we referred it to committee so that we wanted to do it right. And I'm very, very proud to say that today we will have our inaugural meeting with which we will speak to our indigenous ceremony before carrying on from this point on. And I and all of us thought it would be appropriate to, to really do it in a significant matter. And so that's exactly what we will be doing to start this meeting. And so it's with great pride that I would like to start with the following today in terms of reading our land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the lands on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates as part of the treaty land and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, indigenous people inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Unishinabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe-Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work with you on this land, and by suing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. And it's with great pride that I'm going to be calling up Mr. Bear Standing Tall, to preside over this uh, proceeding. And just a little bit about our friend that's here today and a guest that he's brought as where. Bear Standing Tall is a Nahiwa from Onion Lake Cree, Saskatchewan, Treaty 6 territory, and founder of Bear Standing Tall Associates of Toronto. His work as a social entrepreneur consists of consulting and corporate training, creating a bridge between Indigenous and non-Indigenous allies through Indigenous awareness and cultural sensitivity training. He is also an ambassador for Gord Downey, Chain Wenjack Foundation. At Brandon University MB, he completed a Bachelor of First Nations and Aboriginal Counseling degree and is certified with four levels of medicine wheel counselor training and three level levels of medicine wheel facilitator training. He is currently a Master of Social Work candidate at Wilfrid Laurier University. He is also a sun dancer, pipe carrier, sweat lodge keeper, traditional hand drum singer, and leads traditional ceremonies. He genuinely loves this work, sharing authentic indigenous knowledge that 
creates healing, wellness, and reconciliation for Indigenous and non-Indigenous allies, including newcomers to Canada. And with that, I call upon Bear Standing Tall to preside over this ceremony. Welcome. Yeah. And as he's coming forward, I have asked that all members of council and perhaps our acting CAO, Nancy Polzinelli, would preside over the ceremony and participate as well. Bear standing tall, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Dante, Muskom, Sagapu, and Sigarsen. I said, um, hello, my name is Bear Sang Tall. I'm Nehio from Treaty 6 territory. this medicine is that we use this medicine to clean our mind, to open our mind, to have a, have a mind that's in a way where it's uh, purification. So it's like a reset button, right? We want to purify our mind. We want to, we want to have an open mind so we can learn. We smudge our eyes so we can see things through God's eyes, through the Creator's eyes. So when we see something, we see things as sacred. We see the women as sacred. We see the air, the rock, the fire, the trees as sacred. We see things in a different way. We smudge our heart so we can love ourselves unconditionally, so we can love our family, our community, our neighbors, our province, our country, all of creation. Everything that God created, I want to be able to give that love because there's that natural law, kind of like the law of attraction. The more love you give, you're going to receive it. So that starts with this smudging ceremony. We also smudge our ears so we can learn what it is that we need to, need to learn, whether it's the truth or whether it's something new. And this also helps us to understand this ceremony that we're going to, we're going to um, do here. So this ceremony is actually a communication to the spirit world. It's also an acknowledgement to the, the people that have been here before us since time immemorial. When we do our ceremony, we acknowledge the, great, the creator, the great spirit, the boss of all bosses. He's in charge. We're not in charge. We think we're in charge, but we're not really in charge. The creator is in, in, in charge of everything. So when we're in a circle and we have our tools and we prefer 
prepare ourselves. It's all meant to um, purify the air in a space. And I'll give you an example. How many of you have ever went to university and your parents come to visit you and you start tidying up the house, right? Throwing things under the bed. and Well, it's the same thing. When we invite spirit to come and be with us, we tidy our... We tidy up the space, we, we clean our mind, we get our mind prepared. We, 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 we um, purify our mind, our body, and our spirit. And as indigenous people, Anishinaabe people, we believe that there's four parts to ourselves. There's, this, there's the physical part, there's the mental part, the emotional part, but the part you can't see is the spiritual part. So this is part of that spirituality. We have to nurture our physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional in order to, to have balance and have communication. So smudging is optional. You don't have to smudge if you don't want to or you don't feel right because it's, it's out of respect that we give you that option to opt out. So some people have breathing problems or some people have, they just don't like smoke, right? So if that's you, then you have the option to step out of the circle. For those of you that are going to participate in the smudge, and that'll be like the, the council chamber and uh, CAS? C C A O. Yes, you're welcome to come and join us too um, in this beautiful ceremony. In this ceremony, we incorporate vibration and songs that are passed down from generation to generation through oral tradition. A lot of these ceremonies you have to earn. A lot of these songs you have to earn. And a lot of this way, way of life is um, important. So when we smudge, we, we purify the air, the space, ourselves, our mind, our body. And then we, we go into a circle here. And when we're in that circle, that's when that portal opens up. And we can communicate with our relatives in the spirit world. We can communicate with our parents, our mothers, our grandparents, our ancestors, our children, whoever's in the spirit world, and say thank you for looking after us. Thank you for guiding us and protecting us. So we're going to start here. Um, maybe we'll invite everybody, to, not everybody, but yep. whoever's. Very good. If I can special. call upon all my council yes. colleagues and Nancy on behalf of the senior management team, all of those that would like to participate, if you can join me in the center, please. <laughs> So when you're in a circle, you can move your hand, like, your arm like this, and I'll just bypass you, and you don't have to smudge if you don't like to. So I'll be asking you a few questions while we're doing this, like, how many have smudged before? All right, we got some smudgers. I love it. I just put my phone here so I can see what time it is. Uh, keeping track of, uh, oh, there's a clock right there. All right. So as I mentioned, smudging is optional. If you don't want to smudge, you can go like this, go like this, and I'll go to the next person. So when we're smudging, I invite you to send some love and light to those families that needed that from that uh, airline crash and those our relatives in Australia. And everybody that you can think of that needs prayers, as I'm going around with the smudge, send some light and some healing energy and comfort to those families that need it at this time. If you know somebody that needs prayers at this time, please, please send them the, um, good energy. And also for what we're doing here today is, it's almost like we're, we're um, new beginnings like it's so perfect that today is a full moon the wolf moon they call it it's so perfect that it's a new year it's a time for new beginnings and when we practice this way of life the spirituality it's universal it's not just indigenous it's for the human family and it doesn't matter what color you are or where you're from this circle says that we're all connected to everything in the universe we're all related, we're all part of the human family, and we all have to work together to make, make changes. And so when we pray together, what's that saying they say? The family that prays together stays together, and we support one another. 
And this is just one method that we use to do things in the most circuit way that we know how. So when you're smudging, you want to wa wipe, um, go like this with your hands, like you're washing your hands in water. And then once over your head, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and your heart. And when you're done, you say, all my relations, and that means I'm going to the next person. All right? So I asked Peter to say, sing a few sacred songs. Are there any questions before we begin? Everybody ready? <laughs> and Oh, I'm on time. Did you 
amamu taimo kichimantu maskum sugapo in sigasin. Tanamagi gwem skateman, kimuk suksin, nyoe apet the maxian. Maskum sugapo in sigasin. Wichi ak, can a wem not kaki kit the wasim sakuta monuskaki skak mamu taimo. Wichi ak, square suck, nape suck, square walk, nap. Nape walk, me not get to our sim suck. Can a whim none? How me not cocky walk magnuck? Han and a skump tin, skump steak is I get tin. How me not nepiota? Me not cacawi no askia. Me not cocky walk magnuck, kisaki tin. How mamma time on kisaki tin, Mr. Witchy yak, witchy nanota, cocky or tom on his cocky scarf. Great, great spirit, creator of all creation, I say thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you for this gift of life. Thank you for all the things that I take for granted, great spirit. You are all the almighty powerful and I'm small and weak and I'm nothing without you. I say thank you to Mother Earth for providing us everything that we need to survive and I say a special prayer for the water I say a special prayer for our relatives in the spirit world that are always watching over us and our family and protecting us and guiding us. And we ask you, our relatives in the spirit world, to continue to guide us in doing this work that we do today. Thank you for all this, this sacred space here today so we can do a ceremony and so we can lead this, um, this, this place in the new year and kick it off with ceremony in the direction of new beginnings, the direction of, of um, manifesting something that we can all work together to make something beautiful for not only for ourselves, but for our children and our grandchildren, the next seven generations. And I want to um, say a big, big um, thank you to Creator for bringing us here today. And for helping us to, helping us with this ceremony and making it possible, so everything, everything will happen in, uh, in the way it's supposed to be. And I say thank you for that, this uh, tobacco tie that I received today. I received some tobacco to do this ceremony, which is called protocols. And protocol is so important because it works with the natural law. The natural law says. You have to give something before you take something. You can't just take, 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 take. You have to give something. And that's how important that protocol is. And I just want to say thank you to my, um, my good friend Peter Sackany, who's a residential school survivor, for coming to offer his help here today. And I, I, I say thank you for that, Peter. And um, did you want to say a few words? Hi, my name is Peter Sackany. That's my status card name. My spirit name is New Earth. Has a lot of meaning to that because it's coming to that. I'm a residential school survivor. Um, it's good to see reconciliation at work. The process beginning. Um, but I'm the truth to the beginning of it all. To let you know that it's just not words that we share but to educate people to the meaning of that history of truth and recon reconciliation. I went to resident school when I was six years old. I came out when I was 11. I went in speaking my language. I came out not speaking my language anymore. I went in as an Aboriginal person, I came out not knowing what I was anymore. They changed the color of my mind with their education of force. They enforced their education on me. I don't say I'm from Ontario. I don't say I'm from Canada. I say I'm from North America. And that's not because I'm an activist. It's because I believe that we 
have lived in this continent for so long, there was no boundaries or territories. There was no, there was no borders that separated us. I enforce strongly on, on, on that work of the Jay Treaty. The Jay Treaty is part of our history, that the government signed with our people to say that we were allowed to cross that border without question, without being harassed, without being checked out. We just walk across. So when I get to that border, I'm saying I'm from North America. And they know what I mean, they let me go by. So when we come here today to do this, my people come and got me to bring me back to say, you are Native American. This is what you are. Because I carried the shame of who I was for the longest time. I carried the shame of my people because we were poor. We were drunks. We were welfare recipients. These are the stereotypes that came along with who we were, and I didn't like that. So I became a drunk, a drug addict, a street person. I lived that hard life before I realized, and the elders come to me and say, we need you. And we're going to get you back to get your spirit back. And this is what they did for me. So today, I go around, and I help that poor person on the street and pick him up and say, you're a survivor. And I know them. They're residential school survivors. And I can be wearing a suit one day. I'll sit on the street with my suit and sit on the street with them because that's how I work. So I want to say, in short, for being here, what I have to say today is just a summary of what I can educate in three days. So I'm just giving you a top the iceberg of everything, the tip of the iceberg. But the ceremonies that we have here is what we practice daily. It's what I do. I'm a sweat lodge keeper also. And every time I'm in town, Jason got some work, I join him because I love doing this kind of work and I love meeting people. And I thank you for, Jason, for inviting me and for accepting me. English. So I just want to say um, I commend you for uh, following those uh, call to action 92, where it says that we should know the history. And when you're doing something like that, we always begin with ceremony first. You begin with ceremony, you end with ceremony. It's like a, it's like a journey, right? It's not an event. It's an ongoing process. And for um, for appeal to learn um, engagement and protocol and the history, I commend you for that because it's so important, right? And so with that, I say thank you for inviting us. Well, Bear Standing, Colin Peter, thank you very much for making this a very special day. On behalf of my regional councillors, on behalf of all the constituents of Peel, we'd like to offer you this on behalf of having performed this smudging ceremony for us. And thank you very oh. much for making this a very special, memorable day going forward. Thank you to all. Thank you so much. Peter, thank you. Thank you all. So if you don't mind, could I get a picture real quick? We'd, we'd be honored. Okay. Be honored. Can I get a photographer? <laughs> Volunteer photographer? <laughs> this way. And let's all stand on this side. Would you carry the drum? Would you carry this eagle feather? Could somebody carry this smudge bowl? And Peter, look, can we get somebody over here to carry something? <laughs> the air conditioning is on. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank Shake. you very, very much. Thank you. Let me start.
Bear Standing Tall and Peter, thank you very much. I don't know that I could have dreamed of a better inaugural Indigenous ceremony acknowledgement. Thank you very much on a, on a day where I think we really needed it. Thank you very, very much on behalf of Council and the residents of Peel. Okay, let's get to the people's business. Uh, declarations of conflict of interest, are there any? Seeing none, approval of the minutes, December 19th, 2019th Regional Council budget meeting. A move by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Fonseca. All those in favor? That is carried. Approval of the December 19th Regional Council Council minutes. Councillor Innes, move, seconded by Councillor Mahoney. All those in favor? That is carried. Approval of the agenda. Now, just one more, that the council, uh, oh, I'm gonna come to that in a second. What I wanted to do was just to remind everybody, I know you may be aware uh, at this time that Council's attention to the following, the fact that our Waste Management Strategic Advisory Committee meeting on January 16th will be held at the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives, and this exhibit will look at waste in a new way, a creative way so we can generate new and creative solutions. All of Council is invited to attend. I, of course, will be there as well. The tour will begin at 10.30 in advance of the committee meeting, and I wanted to remind you of all of that. Okay, with that, the approval of the agenda. It has been moved by Councillor Fonseca, seconded by Councillor Fontini. Uh, it, sorry? Oh, question. Councillor Parrish. I just want to know if I correct um, my resignations here. I didn't intend to resign from the Ropa 30 committee. Uh, my staff got a breakaway. Okay, very good. And we'll deal with that one. No problem, <coughs> Councillor Parrish. Thank you. Um, and, and we will make sure that that's clarified as we go forward. Um, so that has been moved to second. That the agenda for the January 9, 2020 Regional Council. Was there another? I apologize. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to request, if it's possible, because uh, we have some residents here and staff from the City of Brampton, to move item 17.1 up on the agenda. I'd be happy to. I think that is appropriate. Thank you. So done. Thank you very much. Okay, and with that, that the agenda for the January 9, 2020 Regional Council meeting included communication regarding the Wellfield Heritage Home to be dealt with under items related to Public Works, item 18.3, and further that the agenda for the January 9, 2020 Regional Council meeting be approved as amended, as moved by Councillor Vincente and seconded by Mayor Thompson. All those in favour, that is carried. And with that, I go to our consent agenda. We have the delegations that we spoke with. I go to items... Pardon me, I go to items 9, Communications, Councillor Downey. The first item would be 10.1. Hold, item 10.1. Takes me to items under 11 and related to Human Services, Communications 12.1. On consent, 12.2. To be held, 12.3. Hold. Items related to planning and growth, item 13.1. On consent, communication items, item 14.1. On consent, 14.2. Hold, 14.2. 14.3. Hold, items related to enterprise program and services, item 15.1. On consent, 15.2 has been scratched, 15.3. On consent, 15.4. On consent, uh, hold as well, yep. To be held as well, item 15.4. Item 16.1. Um, <coughs> Councillor Parrish, you've given us your appropriate direction. I think that's taken. Is that good enough and we're done? And I'd like to explain to people I'm not bailing on committees. I've just got three huge projects in my ward this year. I just can't handle driving up here extra Thursdays. I understand. And I think we do have to hold it, though, to deal with replacements on the yep. committee itself that I will deal with at that time. So, Councillor Parrish, thank you for the explanation. But if you could agree to have that held so that we can fill the spaces accordingly. Thank you. So that'll be held, 16.1. 17 items related to public work, 17.1. We've asked to be a delegation, so that's being held and moved up uh, accordingly. Item 18 related to communications, item 18.1 on consent. Item 18.2 we will be dealing with, as well as, I've got 18.3, the Heritage House, but I think that's all enveloped in everything that we have done. And then we move to other business. I have noted the in-camera doesn't, seems rather straightforward at this time, so we can get staff back to work. Is there anybody that would want anything in-camera held? I, I wouldn't think so, it's all straightforward. So good, so that deals with the in-camera as, sorry, 22.1. You wanted to speak to the, 
Okay, very good. So on that piece of it only, uh, 22.1 to be held. All other, other items in camera that have been dealt with. Very, very good. Okay, so with that, I have a motion by Councillor Pileshi, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, that the following matters listed on the Jan January 9, 2020 Council agenda be approved under the consent agenda as we've just enumer uh, enumerated. I need a recorded vote on that, please. Everybody's voting electronically accordingly. Oh, okay, thank you. Madam Clerk and staff, we're just pushing some buttons. Why don't you give it a try now? Here we are. And that carries. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we go to delegations. Item 7.1, Megan Nichols, Executive Director, the Mississauga Food Bank, providing information on the Who's Hungry report, and we bring forward a related item 12.2. Megan, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council for having me here this morning. I'm here to present the findings of a report that the Mississauga Food Bank released in November in partnership with Toronto's Food Banks, and I'm here to share it with you as well at the recommendation of Mississauga City Council, um, as well as share information about how emergency food is currently distributed in Mississauga to ensure that we have a shared understanding of the structures in place. Um, so this year's findings, the data collected for this report was done over the course of a year, doing 1,400 in-person surveys, as well as data from the network of food programs across Toronto and Mississauga. This year, I am dismayed, unfortunately, to report over a million visits to food banks in Mississauga and Toronto, which is an increase of 4% versus the previous year, which is twice the growth of population. We've now reached over 130,000 visits in a year from food bank users just in Mississauga, including all of our 44 agencies. Hungary, you may be surprised, is moving out of Toronto's core, as you can see on this map. It's growing in what we traditionally call the suburbs. And across the Toronto region, Mississauga has seen the highest increase in food bank use at 16%. The areas with highest food bank use line up with those with the highest child poverty rates. We can continue to see food bank use as an indication of poverty. So who's using food banks? It's not equally distributed. Uh, the largest group of food bank clients are single person households. The lack of programs and sp support specifically for single person households has caused this population to fall through the cracks. On top of that, 57% of food bank users have a disability and a third are children. And even higher education no longer protects people. If they've complete, 44% of food bank clients have completed a post-secondary certificate or degree and yet are still struggling to make ends meet. Poverty, of course, is at the core of food insecurity. We see this in clients using food banks with a median monthly income of just over $800. They report that 74% of their income goes towards housing, rent, and utilities, leaving people less than $8 a day for the rest of their basic needs. So now that I've told you a little bit about who is using food banks, I want to make sure that we have a shared understanding about who the Mississauga Food Bank is. TMFB was founded and registered as Food Path back in 1986, the Peel Association to Tackle Hunger, but the Board of Directors chose to rebrand and just focus on the city of Mississauga in the early 2000s. TMFB's role is exclusively to provide food for our network of 44 agencies so that they can focus on frontline service feeding their neighbors. And we provide from 50 to 100% of each of those agencies' food. So through those agencies, we serve a total of 20,000 unique individuals, about 20% of those who are living in poverty in the city of Mississauga. Team FB's network has a neighborhood food bank for each part of the city, as shown on this map, where clients are assigned by their postal code to ensure coverage for the whole city and equal distribution for those who need food banks, regardless of where they live. Clients can go once a month to, eat, to their uh, assigned food bank to receive seven or more days of groceries. Plus, there are an additional 35 other agencies available for people in addition to those food banks, pantries, meal programs, drop-ins, the shelters, breakfast clubs. 
So to ensure we reach as many of our neighbors as possible, we undertook a growth plan feeding Mississauga's future in 2018. We've identified priority neighborhoods where more support is needed for the city, which is represented by those orange hearts on the map there. And we have three strategic priorities in which we're heavily investing from 2018 to 2022. The first is improving access to food by ensuring suitable food programs are close to where people live and work, and that these agencies have the capacity to serve those who use them. This means we have a dedicated staff team who provide training and support, and it's in our plans to start providing financial grants to our agencies in the coming year. We've also launched new programs, such as a home delivery program, and we'll be starting in the next 18 months a full-service mobile food bank. Our second priority is increasing the amount of healthy food available by launching our food rescue program, expanding our internal farm at the food bank, and purchasing culturally appropriate food. And finally, investing in partnerships with other organizations who are working towards similar goals to increase our effectiveness and impact. So naturally, I'm going to have a couple of recommendations for you today. So first off is to continue prioritizing your investments in affordable housing. This is the number one expense that keeps people in low income needing food banks. So please continue to incentivize developers to build affordable units and ensure Peel residents are informed of the new Canada Ontario housing benefit and assisted to join that new program. Secondly, Ensure agencies who receive regional funding are of the highest impact in our communities and providing reporting and information back to you that's helpful for making policies and decisions. And thirdly, my request would be to fund a hub to better integrate agencies across the region to collect data that helps you define policy and to better serve those living in poverty. Ultimately, as charities, we're committed to meeting our neighbors' immediate need for food and their ongoing need for food. But we can't solve hunger alone as charities. As food bank use continues to rise, 16% in Mississauga last year alone, we struggle to meet this ever-increasing demand. And we request government action at all three levels to work together and to partner with organizations like ours to ensure that people have the means to adequate food in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for your presentation. And there are questions. Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Megan, it's great to see you again. We saw each other before the holidays talking about this presentation, but also the um, report that was presented to the City of Brampton in December, which is actually item number 12.2 and related to this item on the agenda. I'm asking if we could bring that forward as well, if that's possible. Uh, as part of this discussion. So thanks so much. I do have a quick question. Now, I know this uh, presentation focuses on Mississauga. Can you just share um, why that is in terms of the data side of things? Mm -hmm. So Who's Hungry is a report that's been done for over 20 years by Daily Bread Food Bank in Toronto. They partnered with North York Harvest Food Bank in the last number of years, and this year they invited us to join them. It's a project led by Daily Bread Food Bank, um, and they felt it gave a bigger picture look at the GTA as a whole to include an additional city this year. Um, there isn't uh, um, reliable data that's centralized for all of the food programs in Brampton that's currently compiled in one place to be able to use the same data for Brampton. Um, across the province and in many provinces across Canada, we use a, uh, a software called Link to Feed, which all food banks who are members of Feed Ontario use and collect data on food bank users. Um, and so we require all of our 44 agencies when people come in, it's like when you used to go to Blockbuster, if you remember that, you have a card and it tracks who's in your family, how often you visited, any special needs. Um, here in Brampton, uh, Knight's Table, who is the food bank who is a member of Feed Ontario, provides that data, but none of the other agencies in Brampton do. And so there's only information available for the 3,200-ish clients who use Knight's Table. So it doesn't speak to the whole uh, city, so it wouldn't uh, present a fair picture to include it in this report. Right, and then in, in item number 12.2, the uh, food insecurity report from Brampton, um, specifically on page 12.2-12, um, our staff put together a summary of what the food network and food distribution network looked like in 
Brampton specifically because a resident, Sylvia Roberts, back in the spring of last year had suggested we start collecting more data to better service the needs of residents in Brampton. And based on that chart, Mississauga has a more formalized uh, network to collect that data. And in the city of Brampton, the majority of the food that's distributed is concentrated in the downtown core specifically and uh, within places of worship. Um, and they're doing amazing work. Regeneration, for example, doing amazing work. Um, but I think to Sylvia Roberts' point, the data collection in a very formalized way is super important because we don't know if we are servicing the residents in Brampton effectively or in the most efficient way. So for example, when we had met, if you can share with us um, how some areas in Brampton are not necessarily being serviced, those, especially those growing areas in Brampton aren't necessarily being serviced because the majority of the services for uh, to access food are in the downtown core. Mm -hmm. If you could share some of that, that would be great. So, as part of our work this year, we looked at areas of the city in Mississauga and looked at where uh, poverty density was highest to know where we needed to add additional agencies. And so we're currently working to proactively find agencies in those neighborhoods, um, those ones that I identified earlier. Uh, let's see if I can find that slide. Um, to how can we add agencies, partner with existing religious groups, uh, and ultimately our plan is to have a mobile food bank to serve those areas. Uh, here in Brampton, there are uh, 16 census tract areas, that's the, the kind of neighborhood definition we used, where there are over 1,000 people living below the poverty line and an additional 39 census tract areas with more than 500 people living in poverty. However, the um, food banks for which you can find, who are consistently open, have a website you can find the information for, are located in one, two, three, three of those um, highest use census tract areas. And you'll see there's, you know, outer areas out along, you know, kind of Highway 50 out in the uh, north uh, east side of the city. There's a significant need, same on the northeast side of, northwest side of the city. Um, and there, there isn't an accessible food bank in those locations. Um, and I think from my vantage point, uh, part of that is, is that we've had to invest and move to a strategic phase of looking at those neighborhoods and actively identifying how we can best serve them. And at this point, that work has not been done for Brampton. So, um, and I support the um, recommendations for sure, because in, in meeting with you and asking a few questions as well, I understand that the majority, if not all of the various uh, places that provide food um, aren't necessarily open after hours. Like they're only open during business hours. So if you're a family uh, or you're a single mom looking to do your grocery shopping and you're working during the day, there's no opportunity for you in Brampton to actually go to a food bank um, because hours of operations are like, it, it doesn't um, uh, service uh, beyond 5 p.m. Um, so I do support the recommendation, especially to fund and establishing a full service network hub for Peel. Um, and I would um, definitely refer this as well as 12.2 back to staff uh, to see how we can create a uh, more efficient and effective um, food network um, to include the city of Brampton. And that also includes investigating, formalizing the network similar to the way that Mississauga is set up as well. Because I think the data collection is super important. When we were um, asking agencies for data in lead up to item 12.2 at the city of Brampton, um, it took a long time to get that data and it's very unclear and inconsistent as to how they are tracking that data. We don't actually know. So as the city of Brampton continues to grow, um, and it is many areas are high needs in wards nine and ten, in wards two and six that don't have access because the food the food banks are all near downtown Brampton. Um, so I think as we continue to grow, we do need to formalize something and f find ways to be more effective in providing this service for the city of Brampton. Um, so I'm going to put that referral forward, and I think Councillor Parrish said she would second it for me too. Yes, um, and then the. F one question I have, or just wanted to flag, that the, the province of Ontario is has recently um, considered changing the definition of what disability is. And I look at your slide, 
uh, profile of hunger who's using food, food banks and 50 percent, 50, over 57 percent have a disability and really worry about that change in the definition and how that's going to have an impact on the food uh, bank system in the region of Peel. So that's also going to have an impact on the city of Brampton as well. So thank you. I move that referral forward. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Megan, for coming in and for your presentation. And I just wanted to ask on, touch on one, and it's the children. So there's 32% of children where you have the profile. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of breakfast clubs in the schools and that, but it's also um, very difficult for some folks to raise the funds to provide those breakfast programs. Um, and as we know, children that go to school hungry, it affects everything. It affects their learning. It affects their overall health. It affects their social um, behavior as well. So I guess one of the things that I really would like to see is for the province to really take this on because I think that it's something that provincially or province-wide there are many children that go to school hungry. And so is there anything that your committee can do to advocate for this at the provincial level? Um, we fund a few breakfast clubs in Mississauga. One of the very frustrating things is that if you receive provincial funding for your breakfast club, you are not permitted to take resources from your local food bank. We have food that we could share. We have enough that we could share with food with breakfast clubs, and yet they're not allowed because the provincial funding for breakfast clubs considers it somehow double dipping for them to take food or resources from uh, the local food bank who would be able to share with them, uh, which from my vantage point is silly. Um, however, we have not... Um, we have not been able to, in terms of provincial advocacy, see any change in, in that decision. But if you are aware in your areas of responsibility of breakfast clubs who are willing to perhaps contravene that rule and would like support, we're more than happy to see what we can do. Even if it's not food, you know, if they need the, we often have, you know, styrofoam plates and cups and all that kind of extra supply that they need as well, happy to be able to provide that to help the breakfast clubs operate. Thank you, Megan, and I certainly agree with that. I, I really don't think it's double dipping because there are many families, and I do have families in my community. I, I represent Bolton, mm -hmm. and I know that Caledon sits um, as part of your group. Mm -hmm. But while the children, while they are able to have access to breakfast through the breakfast program, the mm -hmm. families actually, they need food mm -hmm. to provide food for the other siblings and, and themselves. So. I really think that that's something we should be working on, and Mr. Chair, maybe a letter could go out to the minister, and I think it's Todd Smith, and we do have, um, we have something in here on 12.1 where he's a, a development of a new five-year Ontario reduction poverty strategy. So I think that we need to follow up on that because I, I really don't think it's double dipping. You feed the children at school, but the families need food as well. And I know that there is a growing need in my community. And um, some of my residents will not go to the food bank because it, it, it a impacts stigma. their dignity and, yeah. and they're just afraid to do that because it's very, it, it, people stereotype. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I really would like to see that the province takes this on and, and make some changes in that policy. Um, and I just finally want uh, <clears throat> one question. You have a steering committee. Is Caledon part of that steering committee? No, there isn't a representative from, um, from the, the exchange in Caledon yes. on the Peel Hunger Relief Network steering committee. I'm in touch with Kim fairly regularly, but they don't sit on the steering committee. I would think maybe it would be a good idea to sit on that steering committee because the more people that you have advocating for these changes and these um, things to the province and funding, I think the better it is. And like I said, I, I know that in my community, and it's mostly people in Bolton that use the food bank. Mm -hmm. um, That's where it's located and, too. Sorry? It's located right there in Bolton It's located well. right there, and many of the families that are in Bolton do need additional um, 
financial help. So mm -hmm. thank you again for your presentation, but I would ask, and I don't know how we do that, if it's just taken as direction, Mr. Chair, that you send a letter to the minister. Yes, and the CAO's ahead of you. She said that's something we will refer to committee, and from what comes out of the committee, if the appropriate correspondence has to go through, we will be dealing with that accordingly. So it's been referred on accordingly as part of a larger request. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Sorry, I just want to echo some of the uh, points I heard, particularly from uh, Councillor Santos. Uh, every community uh, has its challenges, but speaking uh, Brampton in specific, um, when we look at census data, or even um, in the schools, we had social risk indexes, what, what not. The the challenge with Brampton in specific is a lot of that uh, data doesn't get captured because we have a huge undocumented population uh, living in Brampton. But the challenges are real and the challenges are there and uh, we do lack um, uh, sort of uh, investment in uh, food bank and, and for food security and, and places of worship have really uh, picked up and it's, it's unique to uh, Brampton but uh, you know I just think of I went to Regan Road it's in uh, Michael Pleshi's area and there's a bus that goes from Sheridan College uh, to Regan Road and that line is so massive for food every single day every single day there's people getting uh, free food me and the mayor uh, went uh, uh, to a temple to launch a tiffin service so they're going to be dropping food off to international students mm -hmm. and none of that is getting funded none of that it's really community driven and so we're going to have to uh, if we want to make uh, especially in Brampton sort of this network we're going to have to find a way to weave in uh, sort of uh, what the place of worship are doing because they're serving a lot of people and um, we need to leverage that as well for if we want uh, a robust sort of um, food network uh, in Peel so that's my comments. It's people of faith who have been feeding their neighbors for years. <clears throat> the food bank in Mississauga was started by, as a collaborative between the synagogue, uh, the Unitarian Church, a United Church, and they came together and said, let's start this interfaith approach. And so many of the agencies who are part of our network um, are faith-based and certainly working with those organizations who are already operating and bringing it together is uh, the best way to have a cohesive network. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. Uh, yes, thank you. Welcome, Megan. Um, I had the great privilege of serving on the Mississauga Food Bank uh, Central Board uh, when I was taking my sabbatical from <laughs> council. And uh, they do an amazing job. The most important thing they do is once a year they ask all their agencies, of which there are dozens. And I'm sorry we don't have a map that shows the little, all the little locations that you're in. There's got to be, what, 200 locations? There's eight big ones or nine big ones and then a whole scattering that all get their food from the, the Central Food Bank in assistance. Um, but they do a survey once a year and they ask the food banks, what do you need that we're not providing? And the big items were milk. There were a few other ones. So I do a milk fund every year for, to help with it. But also when I was on council before, we tried to sit down with the Brampton people. I know uh, Pat Sato and I and uh, Dave Schwerk tried to get a central food bank that would have been on the border mm -hmm. of Brampton and Mississauga so that it would have been extremely efficient. And we just couldn't get the cooperation in those days out of the Brampton folks. So. Sounds like this council from Brampton is far more interested and will probably be more supportive. So anything we can do to get the two groups to work together. Megan's experience is invaluable. Her, her assistance on this would be amazing if she could find five minutes in her week. But uh, re they do an amazing job in Mississauga and it's, it's a, a real credit. The thing that always freaks me out is that 17% of people live in poverty in a city that everybody looks at it and they say, oh, it, you know, Mississauga is so rich, you're so wealthy. Um, as Councillor Groves mentioned, some people just keep their poverty very quiet. And the other thing is a lot of the, the religious institutions take up a lot of the slack quietly as well. So thanks for coming today, um, doing a great job. Really, really. I haven't gotten back to you on the thing that you emailed me on, but I will. Thank you. 
And, and I think it's appropriate to acknowledge, Councillor Parrish, all the work that you've done. I learned about poverty and the extent through you 20 years ago because you're right, it's, we're kind of oblivious to it growing up in Mississauga 20 years. We all thought we were middle class and doing okay. And notwithstanding the hundreds of thousands of dollars you've raised over the years, it's the awareness you've brought to it and we need more of that. So well done on you. Uh, Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just uh, speaking more to the referral that was placed by Councillor Santos, and I agree with um, Councillor Santos's comments and, and especially Councillor Singh's comments around <clears throat> around the data and the unknown in Brampton. You know, Brampton does have a have a food bank hub uh, called Regeneration, and none of the information coming out of the region, the City of Brampton, Mississauga's food bank, the Ontario uh, government identifies what actually. Regen does their distribution around Brampton from all sides east west north south down into Burlington Mississauga and also Toronto so I think that um, talking uh, about the the faith-based organizations and regeneration they need to be included in that discussion but please keep in mind when we are reaching out to them that um, they're of the mindset that they want to put all of their efforts into what they do. Um, they're not political, and nor do they have the uh, expertise to uh, sit down and 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 debate and talk to uh, to staff either at the city or or the region. So I just would like you to keep that in mind by listening to what they actually do. Um, a number of the distribution that's on their list. Um, you know, up into Heart Lake United Church where um, uh, Cowden community members come down and, and, and attend and they, and they, feed, uh, they feed the hungry uh, in Cowden. Not many people know that. Councillor Downey knows that and a few other councillors from, um, and the mayor from Cowden. But, it, you know, we're sitting here saying that, um, you know, we need to do a better job in certain areas. That being said, there's, there are organizations out there like Regen that do a fantastic job. We just don't have that uh, collaboration uh, with them because they don't want to, they've identified that they need to uh, collect more data and, and they're starting with that, they're starting now, but it's, it's very hard for them when the city of Brampton offers no funding, we offer support, um, but not funding to Regen. Mississauga offers uh, no rent to the Mississauga Food Bank. That's so incorrect. My apologies. I was just told that Mississauga uh, offers. You were talking about the hub, not the hub. Yes. Yeah, not we, the food we oh, pay market apology. rent. Yeah, the, the hub. Market okay, so rent. we don't receive any funding from the city of Mississauga either. The food bank. Yes, I, you were talking about hubs. I was thinking youth hub. Try oh. to be clear when you speak. <laughs> we were talking about this item. No, my mind is. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I only ask that uh, Regen gets uh, contacted, and we contact the, um, the other uh, faith-based organizations in Brampton that do the do great work. Thank you, and how appropriate that Commissioner Sheehy's on the list now, because I was hoping that at the end of the conversation, she could be clear on what she understands she's being tasked with, and what we think she needs to bring back. So, Commissioner, thank you. Thank you very much, and through the chair. So just to provide a little bit of context to council, the region of Peel does fund food security initiatives in Peel uh, through the 2018-19 year with the community investment program, we are providing $1.7 million to seven food banks in the region. Uh, I want to acknowledge what Councillor Pileshi has said. The system in Brampton is very different from that in Mississauga, but they are doing amazing work in the area of food insecurity. And I also want to support some of the discussion that I think I'm hearing today. So if the report is referred back to staff, we believe that the first best step is that we work with Brampton food organizations and the city of Brampton on an approach to get better data. Only with more accurate and reliable data can we really determine what the gaps are in Brampton and how we can best fill them. So that's where we think we should take today's delegation and the referral back to staff. And, and while I have you, and what's your timeline? When do you hope to be back to us with a report? So I believe that we could come back in 
the fall of 2020 with a report. We'll be bringing one back on poverty reduction so we could also update on this. I don't want to leave you with the impression that we'll be back in the fall of 2020 with a new system in place. I think what we'll be back with is a plan and the potential for funding that plan to get out there and collect the better data. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for uh, clarifying a bit your understanding of it. Um, I just want to point out in terms of the recommendations that is also being referred back to staff, it also includes from Megan's presentation, fund establishing a full service network hub for Peel. So I would imagine that uh, a cost would be associated coming back from that report being referred to staff, but also in terms of the full service network hub for Peel, I get that Brampton needs to collect data, but also if we can have some recommendations on how the city of Brampton's food distribution um, can be more efficient and effective. So we're talking about hours of operations of the informal network, but also access to the different postal codes and areas that Councillor Singh and also Councillor Pileshi had spoken about. Yes, understood. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if that is clear, Madam Clerk, do I need a formal motion? Okay. So it's been moved by Councillor Santos, seconded by Councillor Parrish, that the matter be referred to our Commissioner and a report to come back in the fall of this year regarding all of the above. Very good. All the show of hands is good enough for this, Madam Clerk. A show of hands. All those in favour, that carries unanimously. Megan, thank you very much thank for you. your time and for all your efforts. Thank you. Okay, moving on. I'm on a 7.2. Audrey Guth, founder and board chair of the Nanny Angel Network, is here to raise awareness of the Nanny Angel Network program. And Audrey, I'll tell you as you're coming forward, I made a call early this morning to a mutual friend of yours and mine. I was on the phone with Joyce Frustalia who I go back with 35 years, if you can imagine. And she told me, you have to be very well received, and I promised her you would be, and I thank you and all of her efforts on behalf of this marvelous cause. I promise you, you will be well received. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of Council. Thank you for inviting me to present today. I'm here to share with you information about the Nanny Angel Network, an essential service that's available to your constituents that feels a serious gap in our health system. I'm actually not here to ask for money. I'm simply here because I want your help in spreading the news that this amazing program is available and that we are in dire need of volunteers so that we can serve your community. This program has been recognized by CNN Heroes, L'Oreal Women of Worth, and most recently, we received the Estella C3 Prize for Cancer Innovation, which came with a 100,000 US award for um, furthering our mission to lessen the impact of cancer. The Nanny Angel Network, or NAN, is a non-for-profit that provides free relief childcare for moms with cancer. Peel Region is an area of great need as so many young families and new immigrants are faced with this terrible diagnosis and they have little family support. The wait list for this service in Peel continues to grow. Nan believes that no mother should ever have to choose between the care of her children and the care for herself. We know that moms who are faced with the choice of, of caring for their children or getting the care that they need often miss critical medical appointments, thus compromising their recovery. By providing specialized relief child care through a network of highly vetted and screened and trained volunteer nanny angels, we're giving moms the opportunity to rest, to attend appointments, and to get well so that they can be the moms they want to be again. Nan also believes that every child faced with a mom's cancer illness needs support, information, and the ability to just be kids just a little longer. We know that children exposed to a long-term illness or death of a parent have a 50% higher incidence of mental health challenges. Unresolved grief leads to depression, drug abuse, and risky behaviors in youth. NAN delivers the Nanny Angel Program for Children 
which helps kids deal with feelings of fear and anxiety. We answer difficult questions that children have, such as, will my mommy die? Did I cause her cancer? Can I cure it? And who will take care of me? We teach kids coping skills and strategies that they can live, that they can use throughout their whole lifetime so that they can grow to be healthy emotional adults, emotionally healthy adults. If a mom dies, we provide bereavement support for one year following her death. So NAN is three things. It's respite for moms. It provides children with a sense of normalcy in a time that's so tumultuous and scary. And we provide bereavement care for the families. Nan believes that with our intervention and support, we're changing the world one child at a time. Um, I've met with Mayor Brown and um, Councillor Dillon, and they've been very helpful in spreading the news in the community, and we've seen an uptake of, uh, of interest in terms of volunteers. I think since we met, I, uh, we've had 17 new volunteers in Brampton, but this is just a tip of the iceberg. There are so many families that don't know about the program, and, uh, and we do have a growing wait list. Um, so I'm asking you today to please use your social media, your newsletters, um, any way that you can communi communicate to your community that this is an incredible service that's available to every single mother who's diagnosed with cancer. And I have a little video I'd like to share with you. The first thing that came to me was the shot. She's so young and innocent, and she didn't sign up for this. I've been very limited physically. What I can do with my children. And when they ask who's going to do things with them, I'm not on their list anymore. She had to reframe me as being fragile and not being the all-powerful mom. They told me that I needed to come in to the hospital and I should bring a friend. I woke up in recovery to a very sad-looking nurse. He said the doctor would be there to talk to me in a few minutes. And I could tell by the look on his face that it was bad news. And then just without any preamble at all, just said, I'm afraid we found something, it's cancer. We actually decided at that point to take Sheba out of school and bring her in with us to the hospital because we didn't have childcare. I came out of the hospital like the Friday and he was back with me by the Saturday. All of a sudden, I was post-operative and I noticed right away that I was really scared to spend time alone with Sheba. The closeness you experience with a young child, I couldn't do it. I can't respond to them, I'm just too tired. Um, and so if they're upset or if they're crying, I can't get up and deal with it. I can't, yes, I just can't function with them. I was speaking to a friend and she knew about this organization that gives you free childcare while going through cancer treatment. When a mom is diagnosed with cancer, the family is in crisis. The Nanny Angel Network is a service that provides free childcare to mothers along their cancer journey through a network of volunteer professional childcare providers. And unfortunately, that sometimes includes bereavement care if the mom passes away. There are nurses, teachers, midwives, the nanny angel comes in, she wants to be there, she's happy to provide the care and the support to the moms. Uh, Lee's great, I adore her. Um, my kids adore her, which is more important. They, they get so excited, they're like, it's Wednesday, Lee's coming, Lee's coming. He's all happy, he loves her. Ruth is also a cancer survivor, so she was able to talk to me about my journey. Any chance to remove stress from my life right now is highly appreciated um, and beneficial to me feeling better. <laughs> Even though friends and family are great and they do volunteer, there is a point where you can ask too much. And I'm not comfortable asking for help. Uh, I've become better at it this year. And that even includes things like calling nanny angels and just acknowledging that I can't be the parent that I want to be this year. Sorry. 
sometimes we have to turn moms away, and that's really, really difficult. But we just don't have the resources and the volunteers to be able to serve and support all the moms who need our help. Thank you. So are there any questions? Yes, there are. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Councillor Groves. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Audrey, for your presentation. Um, I, I may come back to you, Councillor Groves. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Audrey, so much uh, for coming, and uh, it was uh, a pleasure to meet you a, a few weeks back. And I know we uh, discussed uh, how we can get together to uh, talk about more opportunities on how to uh, really get out to the community what uh, the Nanny Angel uh, Network does. So I look forward to having more discussions with you. Um, uh, I, you know, my dad's sister uh, had cancer. Uh, and I saw the toll it took on uh, the two boys. Uh, and um, it's such a difficult time. Uh, so if you don't uh, know anybody, or if you don't, um, if you've never experienced, um, you know, have maybe, maybe having a friend or a family in cancer, it might be tough to really kind of understand what they go through. But uh, I've seen it, and it, it's such a difficult time for everybody. And uh, the support you guys provide is just phenomenal. And I think uh, what we need to do is encourage everybody around the table here today to really uh, look into the Nanny Angel Network, see how each of us uh, as counselors can support you in, in spreading the word going forward as well. Um, and I just want to just say thanks. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to uh, having those uh, discussions with you going forward. Thank thanks you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. I'm going to see if I can, uh, I, I un understand where Councillor Groves is going, but um, I've experienced this a lot in uh, my friends and different things. Outcomes have not been great, but with young children, thank you for what you do is the first thing I want to say. I guess my question is, um, this is a vital, um, and cancer doesn't care who, who it picks, doesn't matter who you are. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a nasty disease, but I guess my question to you is, how can we support you to help grow and make awareness of this network and to be able to continue on to bring volunteers in to support this? Um, this is a great network. Um, I was aware of it before now, but I'm really Thank glad you. you came and delegated, put Thank a face you. with it. So I, I, I know uh, Peel's big and it's complex, but it doesn't matter. Cancer hits everywhere. So I guess my question to you is, uh, when you're short of volunteers, as you say, yes. in the, how can we help you to be able to deliver the great work that you do? Uh, thank you, um, Mayor. We have, uh, I'd like to explain our, our volunteer network. It's comprised of um, students who are in their last year of teaching or nursing or social work who want to get the experience that they need to be able to go on with their careers. And then we have a huge network of volunteers from the um, retired community who are retired teachers of principals. And, and uh, our criteria is that a volunteer have at least one year of experience working with children in a professional setting because we're going into homes in crisis. This isn't in any way babysitting. It is a program that is designed to help children build that resilience, kids who, um, who are affected by unresolved grief. And I can say that if you go into any drug rehab center or prison, you will find a great deal, a great number of those people have had issues with unresolved grief. Grief is loss of normalcy. It's loss of, of anything. It's not just death. So these children ha who have a sick mom and, and 
everyone knows that cancer is not fixed in a very short period of time. It's a minimum of a year. So being exposed to a year of a mom's illness, kids have something called unresolved, uh, have anticipatory grief. So there's a lot of anxiety, and if you don't deal with that, um, these children can't grow up to be healthy adults. So our volunteers are specially trained. We have a really intensive program on grief and bereavement, on coping strategies, on skills. So we have a lot to offer our volunteers. There's a lot of, of an ability for them to grow personally. And it's also, we've heard from our volunteers who, some of which are cancer survivors themselves and want to have a way to make sense of this, um, I call it random act of unkindness because there is no other, other answer. To be able to, um, to give back in a way where you have an immediate impact is so rewarding. So I think our first ask is just to um, let your constituents know that there is this amazing organization that needs their help. It's a four hour a week commitment to a family. Families who are high risk, we try to provide more than one volunteer, but consistency is really important for children. So it's the same volunteer that goes in every week. So I think helping us spread the word, A, that we need volunteers, and B, that, that if there is a family with a cancer diagnosis that we're there to help, and that there, it's guilt-free, it's guilt-free help. They don't have to feel that uh, guilty as, as you do when you have to ask a family member for help. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Pileschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Audrey, it was uh, nice meeting you a few weeks back when we were in the hallway on the way to the meeting with That's Patrick right. and, and uh, Councillor Dillon, um, and you, you gave me a brief description on, uh, on what you were doing and, and the support that uh, that was out there, and I found it so important that I sent uh, Anjan, my assistant, to uh, um, in the meeting with, uh, with you guys, and um, I... Uh, I you know, I really have to say the the video and and the one lady about uh, you know what she said about it takes so much effort and and just to just to say that the, there's an issue and identify it and, and to reach out and and ask for help and that's in in many of the um, communities all throughout um, it's it's almost that's that's the biggest issue is uh, is for moms how strong they are mm -hmm. um, to actually reach out and uh, and ask for help I know my mother would never growing up she never asked for help are you kidding no way so um, in particular also the uh, the South Asian community because cancer yeah. is uh, um, it's a secret in it's the South Asian secret. community nobody knows until <clears throat> so I'm not sure, um, you know, as, as much as, as counselors around this table can can push and promote and support and, and do everything we can do, um, I just want to ask that you continue to uh, reach out to us. If you see something that, uh, that we can help with, um, please do. If there's anything, any type of support that we can, we can provide, um, I know Ryerson offers the nursing program and, and mm -hmm. Sheridan has a program as well. Um, if we can, you know, sit down with them and, and talk to them and, and support and promote, uh, please. Uh, I'll, I think every member here will give you their, their personal contact information just to say, you know, reach out, talk to us and, and yeah. throw us a text and, and let us know how we can help. Thank you very Thank much for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. My husband was recently in the hospital, he's fine, uh, but he, there was a, a roommate he had, and the wife was, I would guess, probably late 60s, and all she talked about was the fact that she wanted to reach out and help people. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of her. Now, when you say you have to have had uh, experience, um, she loves to cook, and she's mm -hmm. South Asian. So what better than to send somebody out that can make a, a meal for a family once a week for a couple hours and play with the kids? She's a grandma. Mm -hmm. so. You're talking to the right group because we all know people like that because we come in contact with them all the time. And I hesitate to say this, but we sometimes have people that literally are on the phone all the time to us because they're lonely and they want something to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we could all compile a list of people if we sit and rack our brains. But would it be acceptable to have someone that, that just loves to cook and is a grandmother and would like to take your training and check out how she is? 
you know, we've struggled with that, but because it, it's so complex, this uh, when you walk into a family in crisis, and uh, that we've really set the criteria that they do have to have a year of experience working with children. And our mission is really childcare. Although it's, uh, mission creep is, <laughs> is one of the things that we struggle with because a lot of the families, I mean, housekeeping and, and we we're talking about food and, and all of the things that are issues. It's such a, a multi-problematic uh, thing for many of these families. And then you layer on a cancer diagnosis, but we really need volunteers who do have that one year of experience. It is a challenge for us going into the South Asian community. It is a secret, cancer is a secret. And for most cultures, they, everybody wants to protect their children from knowing about it. But we know that, that that only causes problems in the long run because kids are so intuitive. I can tell you that um, children, if you don't use the right language with children that um, for example, if you say to a young child, your, um, she's with, your mother has passed away and she's with the angels now and she's out of pain and she's looking down upon you, you know, kids are so literal. So you know, that could cause fear in a child for years and years and years to come. Mm -hmm. And so it's so important for us to have the uh, professional volunteer with the specialized training who knows what to say and how to and how to manage the situation. Well, thank you for that answer, and I will be thank searching. You. I'll find okay. some people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Innes. Thank you for your presentation, and over here. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> thank you for coming today, and most importantly, thank you for what you do. Um, as a single mom of young children, it's often a very significant worry for myself that I should become ill and something would happen and it becomes uh, a burden upon friends and family. Um, and so I, I want to say thank you for, for everything that you do. Um, and, I, and I know that we're all happy to share as much as we can in social media and our newsletters and to try to get that message out. And I think it's really important that while we get it out today that we continue to, to pull it out so that it doesn't um, fall to the side. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that there are some really relevant and important organizations that you may be able to draw and partner with. And, and I would maybe ask, I'm sure you've probably reached out to many of them, like Wellsprings mm -hmm. Chink uh, Chinkuzi, yes. um, our hospice, as well as the school boards, um, our earlier centers across Peel. Um, but I would just ask staff to make sure that those contacts are made available to you. Mm -hmm. um, if in case there's something that has been missed, because Peel is a big place, um, and um, all of those groups pulling together do wonderful work, uh, and I think that the addition of your organization would be most helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Well, on behalf of all of us, I hope you believe you were well received, and I hope you can understand why. What a noble calling that you've taken upon yourselves. We wish you the very best, and hope that we can be helpful in your endeavors. So thanks to you, and give Joyce my very best as I well. I will. Thank you Motion of receipt much. of the delegation. All those in favor, that is carried. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That brings me down to item that we've added 7.3. That also relates to 18.2. Councillor Vincente, we were going to have a, a delegation. Perhaps if you can help me out as to who we've nominated as the presenter from the crowd. Is that my understanding that we were going to have someone that wanted to speak to us on this? Councillor Vincente? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe staff uh, have an update, and I would recommend that we listen to that first. Very good. Uh, we have representatives from Heritage and Planning from the City of Brampton here, and I know that uh, Mr. Dan O'Reilly is also uh, here to listen to uh, what is about to be revealed here, and he may have some comments, which I would certainly welcome him to have the opportunity to make. Very good. So Thank through you. to the appropriate staff first, if they'd like to come forward and give us a bit of an update. And for the benefit of the audience, why don't you tell us exactly who you are? So good morning, Chair, members of Council. I'm Gary Koslek. I'm the Director of Transportation. Uh, with me is Gail Gorman. Gail is the Manager of Real Estate. Thank you. Please proceed. 
we just wanted to take five minutes today to provide a fairly quick update on the, the matter at hand regarding uh, the demolition of 11962, the Gore Road. This was brought to council, I believe, slightly before the Christmas break, um, and it was asked to go back, do some additional research, and return to council with an update. So as background as council, council would be aware, you know, Mayfield Road and Gore Road are both uh, regional roads um, that are essential to primarily Mayfield, the east-west, um, uh, an east-west corridor to support both growth and uh, the goods, goods movement in Peel. One of the challenges we've faced at this intersection is on the one corner, so on the south side of Mayfield Road, on the west is 11962, which is the uh, brick house that's in question. And on the east side is the, uh, get the name right, St. Patrick's Church and Cemetery, which is a designated heritage uh, site. And when we went through the design process to um, come up with a design that can build an intersection that can facilitate these two new roads. It was very clear that the preference was to shift the road to the west to avoid impacting the cemetery or the church. After we got through doing that work, we, we went through a number of assessments, and this goes back to about 2010. So the work's been going on for quite a long time. A lot of coordination with uh, Brampton's Heritage Committee. And they looked at options to possibly remove uh, move that house on site. And after a lot, a lot of um, design and, and research, there, there isn't space on site to actually re relocate that facility. Sorry. We're supposed to have a presentation here. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, so the class environmental assessment for the widening did conclude uh, that we had to avoid the heritage uh, church and cemetery. The road would be shifted to the west, and it does the, require the removal of, of the house on the west side. So some of the actions that uh, staff have undertaken over the uh, past while. We've looked at a lot of um, possibilities to actually try and accommodate um, both needs. And I think at, at last the last meeting there was a suggestion that uh, possibly CanDevCon could have a site that was available to relocate the house to. Uh, earlier this week we did get a response from CanDevCon. We appreciate them. They did a, a fairly th thorough investigation, but unfortunately they were not able to come to a site or find a site that was suitable to relocate that uh, particular structure to. So, so in the past, um, we did do an expression of interest. We had extended it for nine weeks. There was no interest from any member of the public to look at moving the, this uh, facility to another site. In October 2019, Brampton Heritage Board and the City of Brampton approved the demolition of, of the structure. And in December 2019, uh, we were asked to look at this option with CanDevCon, but it didn't bear fruit. One of the other things that uh, came, we were asked to look at more recently was, was there an option to move the house to the St. Mark's Church property? They have, it's a relatively large site. And we did confirm last night uh, staff confirmed with uh, the diocese from the church that it has absolutely no interest, even if the region was to pay the costs and move, move the uh, structure, they have no interest in any way in that house being moved on to the church property. So that, that one has been looked at. And from a staff perspective, the next steps we recommend, um, the water main is, is scheduled to be tendered for replacement sometime around March of this year, and the construction probably start around June. So in order to meet those uh, construction timelines, the, the house has to be removed from the site. The, the water main actually goes through right through the house where the house is physically located. We've, um, and, and, and when you extend that, this is actually the beginning of the construction. So I got a, a quick timeline. So the, um, 
The water main construction would be done over the course of two years. It's 2020, 2021. Late 2021 and 2022, the utility relocation in the area would be completed. And then road construction would start in 2023 and be completed in 2024. So there's a, it's a long process. There's a lot of parts to actually getting this physical construction completed. And it will take time. If the house isn't removed, there will be a delay, probably a year, in getting the water main uh, construction project going, which will just create a domino effect, delaying the utility work and actually delaying the construction of the uh, the road widening. And both the water main and the road widening are, are desperately needed for traffic capacity not now, but really to accommodate the growth pressures that are coming. So our, our uh, recommended next step is that we proceed to uh, move forward with the demolition. Staff have done the spec specifications up that are needed to actually get the work done, and they're ready to get the request for quotation out as early as today so we can get that moving and meet the construction timeline for the water main. Um, and one of the things that's come out of this, I know the requirements for um, either moving or removing uh, heritage homes, are very, it's very specific and I, staff do meet or exceed those requirements. We really try to do everything we can to um, do a good job in this area, but we recognize that you know, a lot of these structures are very important to people and one of the things staff are committed to is, is looking at continuous improvements and talking to you know, other communities and see how maybe, even though we go on, uh, above and beyond, maybe there's other things that we can do that actually will improve the process and help us to get through this uh, more efficiently in the future. Okay, thank you. That's the presentation um, to members of council, starting with you, Councillor Vicente. Any questions of staff at this time? Mr. Chair, no, thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, just to add on to Peel Region staff's uh, oral report, if we could just invite our Brampton City staff to provide an update on the history of the work that they have done to try and save this property. Thank you, and I will do that in a moment. Councillor Rast, did you have a question? You'll wait. Very good. Uh, staff, thanks to you. If there's no other questions, and if our friends from Brampton and our colleagues could come down and give us a bit of an update as well from the, the local municipality perspective. Welcome, ladies. And if you two could give your names and uh, we were for Brampton, your titles for the record, please. Sure. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm Antonetta Minikilo. I'm the manager of the Community Innovation and Resilience, and this is Cassie Jasinski. She is a heritage planner with my team. Thank you. So with respect to the property on 11962, the Gore Road, we have been working closely with the Region of Peel staff. Every effort was made to try and save the building, try and deal with uh, alternate solutions like relocation, seeing if there were any private interested parties who would uh, take the property and relocate it. We also offer it for sale, sometimes at a nominal price of $1 to see, again, if there's any options of saving the resource. In terms of our requirements under the Ontario Heritage Act, we did identify in our report to the Brampton Heritage Board and to City Council that the property does meet the criteria for designation. And therefore, every effort should be made to save the building. In Brampton, for the most part, we're very successful at that, but there are very rare occurrences like this one where a number of circumstances lead to the fact that a building cannot be saved. So I think from my perspective, we've done what we can do. We brought it forward to the Brampton Heritage Board, who ultimately is an advisory committee to council and plays that role. And they too have been along with us on the journey in the multiple steps to try and save the building and made the recommendation to council that the demolition could occur. I, I can offer my colleague if she would like to add anything to that as well. I, I, <coughs> excuse me. I, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to point out that in terms of the range of opportunities that we looked into, uh, this included uh, potential negotiation uh, through settlement for moving the property to another site close by, talking with other municipalities in terms of how they dealt with situations such as, as this, including the city of Markham, because they're very successful in terms of the heritage estates that they have. Uh, and we even spoke with uh, members of our other departments, including the chief building official, to see if there was an opportunity to relocate the structure to a city site. 
And unfortunately, all of our efforts, as much as we might have been buoyed at the time to think that there was a solution, uh, none of these came to fruition. And uh, so the, the situation for heritage staff is, is unfortunate. This is never something that we like to see happen. Um, and it only happens in very rare circumstances and um, not the solution that, that we were looking to see. Thank you. And I would add, before I go to my list, I had the privilege of a briefing earlier this week from our staff. And I've got to commend the Brampton Council and the team that you have there for your exhaustive efforts on this file. I was made aware of them as well. You truly left no stone unturned, as did the Brampton Council. And I think I can say the same of my staff as well. So I was made very aware of that as well. So with our thanks to you for that. I have a list. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think you used the, uh, the correct word, exhaustive. And I think uh, when we deal with um, uh, our heritage staff, they use uh, every, um, well, they take every step that's uh, required. And I think they go above and beyond the call of duty to try to uh, preserve these heritage sites. I know there's some members of council as well who are very uh, active uh, in the preservation of these heritage homes. And so um, I, I do, uh, I know uh, our regional staff and our uh, city staff did their best, um, but uh, this is one of those rare occasions where really there was uh, nothing else that uh, uh, could be done. Uh, but I just want to say I really do feel for the area uh, residents as well. They've been very active. We've uh, uh, worked uh, with them as well to, to preserve as much heritage as possible, whether it was, uh, you know, Sister O'Reilly Road or uh, Father O'Reilly Park. Uh, we've uh, did our best, but. Uh, uh, this is one of those situations where uh, we really uh, were packed up in a corner. So I just want to just uh, uh, apologize to the residents if there are any here today in regards to this. Um, but uh, we do look forward. I know Councillor Singh and I, as the local uh, uh, councillors, look forward to working with them uh, going forward. Thank you. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, too, want to echo Councillor Dillon's sentiments, and uh, I can attest to the work that staff have, work, have tried to find ways to save this house. And um, over the past week, uh, we have been in conversations with um, Father Vito Marzigliano, who is the pastor of St. Patrick's Church, and he was willing to um, work to try to find a way to position the property just across the street um, on St. Patrick's site. They have a couple of different locations where uh, that would be ideal if this home could be moved. But um, he, of course, requires permission from his chancery office. And uh, we had conversations uh, with the chancery office. And uh, surprisingly, uh, they have a planning department just like we do and of course you would expect that from an organization that owns so much property so we had conversations with Mr. David Finnegan who is the director of planning properties and housing and they confirmed with us that uh, despite all of the attempts and all of the wishes for uh, a solution to be found that uh, the church which in my opinion would have been the best location for us to relocate the property, it's just across the street, it would reduce the costs and um, maximize the uh, chances of success because when you're moving a masonry building like this, you really want to keep that move as short as possible. Um, but um, they um, are, con of course, uh, have other priorities. They are currently fundraising to build a new church and uh, the idea of uh, taking on an additional property that would incur not just an initial expense, but ongoing cost to the parish. It was just more than what they could uh, accept. And so um, I am comfortable with uh, everything that staff have tried to do, that we have all tried to do to rescue the house. And um, I, I, I want to thank the residents and Mr. Dan O'Reilly in particular for raising this issue uh, to the point where it actually gained national coverage. Uh, we've had emails from people all across the country who either have direct connection to Brampton or who are people who love saving, love heritage buildings like this one and uh, asking us to try to find a way to save the house. Uh, but ultimately, the costs just make it prohibitive and uh, it, there's just no way. And so I want to thank you all. And Mr. Dan O'Reilly, if you want, do you have any words that you'd like to share with us today? 
Thank you, staff. If I can add, perhaps yes. through you, Mr. Chair, before Mr. O'Reilly comes down, when a decision like this is made, the building is never lost in its totality. From an environmental perspective, we ask for the salvage and reuse of materials. That was one of the conditions. And then something else that we do is to commemorate that long-standing history in the Wildfield community. We do commem commemorative signage, interpretation, and a series of other things to ensure that the history lives on in some physical form in the community. And we're happy to engage with the residents to discuss what that could look like and even co-author and co-write what the interpretive signage would say at the community there. So those pieces of history, while they might not stand in the way we're used to, now, they still continue to form part of the cultural landscape in Brampton. Thank you. Uh, and before I have you speak, sir, and you're more than welcome to speak, I do have two other speakers on my list, and I don't know if they may have questions of the delegate. So, Councillor Sinclair and then Councillor Innes, then I'll go to the delegate. Councillor Sinclair. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. There seems to be something missing in the heritage designation and preservation program you do all the work to designate a property. It still doesn't stop someone coming along saying, well, we want a demolition permit anyway. Or major development comes in, and it's simply not suitable to keep that structure in that location. And sometimes the whole idea of keeping something in a certain location ends up so, with some real sore thumbs that don't belong in the new land use at all. And, I noticed over in the uh, city of Markham quite a few years ago, they, uh, the city did their own subdivision for heritage houses. And uh, the eligibility to have a lot there is that you have to move a really important heritage house and possibly drive shed onto that lot and live in it, restore it, and it's designated there. And I think we should have some conversations up in Caledon about that whole idea of a subdivision specifically designated for such important houses. <coughs> and uh, I don't see why if that occurred, it would not include houses from Brampton because of course that's old Chinkusi Township anyway. And uh, so I, I'll certainly be talking to uh, Caledon's heritage uh, officer and uh, see if we can bring a conversation towards uh, council at Caledon about developing such a subdivision. And there's going to be quite a few important houses marooned as the white belt gets developed in Caledon. So those are just my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Innes. Thank you, Chair, and uh, to follow on the heels of, of Councillor St. Clair's I, um, suggestion of bringing forward a motion to, to Caledon Council, I think it's a great idea. I actually think it should come to Peel because while this affects the Wildfield community, which is a community that I represent, it's also represented by some of my Brampton colleagues. Um, it's, and so really, it's a, it's a Peel heritage that we're trying to protect, no different than the Britannia Schoolhouse. Um, I want to thank staff for going through their exhaustive efforts, both here at the region and at the City of Brampton, um, and thank Councillor Vincente uh, from the Heritage Committee, as well as my colleagues on the other side of Mayfield Road, Councillor Dillon and Councillor Singh. Um, I know that when this was brought to everyone's attention um, by Mr. O'Reilly, um, that um, you guys all did what you could do and worked extremely fast in dealing with some organizations that move very slow. Um, so I, I want to say thank you on that behalf. Um, when we talked about this issue last time around, um, I, I mentioned the fact that in Caledon in particular, it's, it's going to become more and more of an issue. Um, we have many, many hamlets that are now beginning to celebrate their bicentennials. We have many heritage homes, um, some opportunities of uh, restoring those homes. We have beautiful examples, a recent one in Bolton with the Sam Mora project, um, and, and went above and beyond what they could to restore that home and to keep it actually in the community. So um, I'm going to put it out to staff while I know we can't save everything all the time, and we try our hardest to. Um, 
I would really like to see in the future the steps that we're going to take to ensure that all efforts are exhausted on some of these heritage homes. And, and perhaps that's a combination of a, of a report that would come forward with suggestions by Councillor St. Clair today about is it is it an option or a possibility for us to create uh, a subdivision or to purchase land because that is the most expensive part from our perspective um, and, and create some sort of a partnership for a place for some of these homes, similar to um, Black Creek Pioneer Village. Um, I'm not saying that we start a tourist destination, um, but something that we can use as an example to protect and, and preserve some of these homes that have significant heritage and meaning within our communities. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paleshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I like kind of where the conversation is going. Um, you know, Councillor Downey and I worked on something for um, a little over a year to try and get a, a heritage church that was in an unsafe uh, environment up to to Caledon to, um, to be supported by a, an outside organization. And, you know, in the end, we weren't able to, um, we weren't able to, to essentially do what we what we thought was the best thing to do and it was it was extremely difficult but um, I think that um, when we're when we're having these types of discussions and and there are outside organizations that that can provide a certain level of service to um, to what we want to to accomplish and and you know just in in my mind we talk about the butterfly project and how amazing it would be for um, heritage buildings to be set up in a type of, of subdivision that uh, has that look and feel of, of maybe another butterfly project in, uh, in the region of Peel. So I think there are lots of opportunities. Um, I think when it comes down to, you know, the dollars and cents of things and, uh, and the efficiency of, of these matters, um, outside help is is what we need to uh, what we need to be looking at, and I think there are organizations out there that uh, that can provide that. Uh, it's just uh, it's reaching out and, and finding them. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I will call Mr. O'Reilly up now, but I will take advantage of this opportunity, just given the conversation that we've had. Um, it was a very young, ambitious, and well-intentioned councillor 31 years ago, who's your regional chairman now, who suggested 31 years ago we should build a pioneer Black Creek village here in the region of Peel. And what I learned and what you might be cognizant of now is two things. Number one, as Councillor Carlson can tell you, Many residents right away say, no, no, you moron. If you move this out of Streetsville, it loses all its importance. So it's no advantage. And number two, you also ran into the people that said, you idiot, because the structure's there, they can't develop. If you move the structure now, they can develop. That's what we were trying to forestall anyway, which has happened time to time over my 30 years as well. It's not as easy as it seems. Then number three, you have to build a facility and suddenly it's my badlands all over again and it needs parking and it needs... It's easier said than done and it has been looked at in the past. Doesn't mean we can't look at it again, but it isn't fraught with its own issues in and of itself. Mr. O'Reilly, welcome. Thank you for all your efforts, first of all, on the file. And I think we do owe you a few words more. Councillor Parrish, did you have something? Now I saw you back on my... Or do you want to wait for the... Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you on behalf for all of your efforts. I don't think that should get lost in all of this. And I think we do owe you a few moments more to give us your final thoughts. Uh, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I do want to thank the council and the staff for considering this last minute option. This is very disappointing, but that is what it is. Um, I did see, I, I want to take up on what Ms. Minichello had said about saving some of the elements from the house. Hopefully they could recreate I mean, some sort of interpretive plaque, um, pavilion on the site of the new church. I also did see in one of the uh, reports leading up this, on this whole issue that there still would be room for a plaque on that original site. Uh, so I'm going to be following up with a report, my own letter to council um, about what I think should be on the site, because there's not just that house. Right immediately north of it was a, a, a store. It was built in the 1890s and then became the convent for the Loretto sisters for about 30 years. 
So if that, that, if there is space for some sort of plaque, I'm hoping that there would be um, uh, commemorating that um, convent and, and, this, and the, this building that we're speaking as, as well. So I guess that's my comments. Thank you very much, and I think you've heard around the table we're very sincere in wanting to pursue those, and I think we're all moving in that direction as well. Huh. Are there any questions of this delegate at this time? Seeing none, I will thank you for your presentation, and again, on behalf of all of Peel, for your efforts on the file and those that have gone to such great lengths for a very good cause. We have to commend you for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And for your understanding of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Very good. What I have before me, Madam Clerk? Yes, I wanted to be clear. So I now need direction to staff to proceed as per the staff report that we've just been given. It's Thank you, Councillor Vincente. It's been moved by Councillor Vincente. It's been seconded by Councillor uh, Paleshi. Thank you very much. All those, show of hands, Madam Clerk, on this one. Show of hands, all those in favor. That is carried. Uh, Councillor Parrish, I'm sorry, did you still have something? Go ahead, I, I, I said I would no, allow it. No, I actually it. probably should speak because I'm Please. agreeing with you for probably oh. one of a few times. Oh, no, it's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have, a, George and I are on the Heritage yep. Committee in Mississauga. We get lectured constantly about moving heritage buildings, that they lose all their context, they lose the value of a heritage building. So, and the idea of clustering a whole bunch of buildings from different eras in different locations in one spot would make most heritage experts tear their hair out and rend their clothing because that would completely destroy where they came from and the history of each of the houses and kind of turn it into a Disney world. So I was just going to comment on that. I was going to agree with you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Parrish. Councillor Carlson. Well, I'm loath to make any suggestions about my neighboring <laughs> municipality, so mm -hmm. the merits of this case can be discussed by the people who live in Brampton. But the, my colleague quite correct, like beaten into my head for 20 years on the Heritage Committee, sometimes against my will because I think I started off with the idea of many of these ideas were great, Pioneer Village and, yeah. and so on. And then in the descending order of preference, the creation of the Pioneer Village is viewed as one notch above demolition. And, and plaque is, I'm putting the plaque where it used to be, or naming the subdivision after the field that used to be there. It's the same sort of idea that it's really not the done thing, and, and these are international standards that are used in heritage, and along with facadism and saving fronts of yeah. buildings, these are all largely discredited practices. So uh, I, I certainly, if it ever comes to that here, I mean, it's a regional decision. I'd like to be able to vote against something like that, be just out of, but not. I certainly don't want to tell Brampton and Calvin what to do in their own uh, right, but putting different types of architecture next door to each other, this is like me trying to sell plush one of those knockoff Rolexes or something, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a bad thing to do. And it, it, it doesn't go over in the heritage, I'm sure the heritage experts here would, would be glad to explain in more detail. It, although it is one notch above demolition yeah. and, and that's it. So when, whenever the Markham example comes up, there's much fainting and, and harumping and so on in, in the heritage world. So I put that out there to you. Just before you get all excited about picking up three acres at two million an acre or something, yeah. to put to put a few uh, put a cluster of unrelated buildings together, uh, just just doesn't work. But you can move them on the lot reluctantly, move them back, move them forward. But even the orientation should stay the same, so that you had a story that says Farmer Brown wanted a east uh, uh, facing building, so the sun would come across the crop. So they're very fussy about even that type of stuff. But just taking it and plunking it. Uh, doesn't go over very big, and so I, I put that out there for whatever it's worth to my colleagues. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. From the mouth of someone who would know it better than anyone, thank you, George. Councillor Sinclair. Yes, thank you. I uh, don't think the uh, Markham subdivision is uh, a pioneer village at all. It's people live and maintain their own houses. It's quite different, and I wouldn't suggest a pi pioneer village at all. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Actually, the Markham subdivision was partially through the uh, 407 to uh, relocate a lot of the farms that re-established the homes. Uh, they did bring other homes across Markham to make that subdivision. But in Peel, we did the same with the 407, and that's at Churchville. There was a street made up of a number of homes that were, but that was all covered by, th a lot of that funding came from when the government was moving those homes too. But 
the example that Councillor Sinclair is talking about is that Churchville subdivision, and I, or the street, I should say, of Heritage Homes. And I don't know how that still works today, but that's how that all came, to, came about and how that happened. Thank you. Thank you to all for some very diligent, sincere efforts and for arriving where we have. I have um, one last speaker. Andrew, Commissioner, did you wish to speak? Go ahead. Thanks, through you, Mr. Chair, and I don't want to prolong the discussion any longer, but I'd be remiss to mention, we had Gary up here presenting today, and Gary's last day in the office is going to be next Friday, and I know a lot of you have had the opportunity to work with him over the years. He's been here for 13 years. His actual last day is the end of February, but he's taking uh, six weeks of well-deserved vacation, so I just wanted to mention that. Yes, here, here. Here, here. I agree. And, and has endeared himself to this chair and so many of our counselors because he walks into a room with the idea of, here's the bad news, but how can we fix it? <laughs> and that's a refreshing view, and it's very much welcome. We wish you all the very best. And I'm going to be seeing you in a few days when you're on your way, and I think many of us will be popping in. Okay, thank you for that, Andrew. All right, with that, that concludes all of my delegations. There are no staff presentations, so we're on to items related to health. Councillor Chair Downey. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, one item was held, item 10.1, uh, correspondence from Christine Elliott, Office of the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. It was, uh, I think, held by Councillor Raz and Councillor Parrish at the same time. I'll leave it to you. Okay, no, we can speak simultaneously. Um, I just wanted to know what the staff intends to do with the 1.143 million in that um, the the province says we have to actually service people through dental buildings or dental clinics. And we have been obviously trying to ask them to look at the way we serve it, which saves us money and seems a more efficient way of doing it. So I'm just wondering what we're gonna do with the 1.143 million. So through the chair, there will be a uh, full report on this coming on the January 23rd council meeting. But to give you a preview, when the ministry approves funding, it is for very specific projects. So the two projects that were funded were, first of all, a mobile dental clinic. And then second of Good all, um, they funded uh, well for the Health and Smiles Dental Clinic. In addition, uh, previously in the fall, because the program started quite late in the fall and they had already given operational dollars, they advised us to remove the, um, the Malton Four Corners and fund that through operational dollars, which we did, and that program is already up and running and seeing clients there. Um, so there will be more information provided. Um, these two builds will see us uh, allow us to see about 1,800 more clients annually. Council will recall that we're currently able to see about 800, so this is certainly an improvement, um, and we will continue to advocate for uh, fully funding all of the capital submission previously, and that will form part of our recommendation to Council for the January 23rd report. That sounds like a very sensible answer. Thank you very much. Um, on a slight sidebar, the Wellfort Center is going to be right beside our um, youth hub that's going in. And they are going to be seeking kids that have dental problems and bringing them over to Wellfort. The, they built those two dental offices with uh, provincial money. It wasn't anything from us. Um, is there a way we can see if we can get that operational or do they just have to deal with seniors there? Uh, so through the chair, the, um, the CHCs also do provide some service on uh, Healthy Smiles Ontario program. Um, so perhaps, Councillor Parrish, if you're okay, we could take this online and have some further discussion about yeah, how no, we can make be, sure the children are getting service as well. That would be terrific because okay. a lot of the kids that will be going into the hub have serious emotional problems because of their teeth. And I think it's a good service. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, no further speakers to that. Do I need to move receipt? Moved by Councillor Parrish, seconded by Councillor Raz. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have items related to human services, chaired by Councillor Medeiros. Councillor. Thank you. I don't believe there's any. Oh, sorry. Uh, who held? Oh, 
Uh, just to uh, help you there, uh, I believe we have a hold on item 12.2. 12 .2. Is that correct? It's 12.2 and 12.3. So 12.2 was? Councillor Santos. Councillor Santos. Councillor Santos. But it was, it was touched in the delegation. Yeah, we dealt with it. Yeah, so that item is also dealt with. Okay, so, so Councillor uh, 12.3, Councillor Parrish. Yes. Thank you. Uh, on page two of the report, um, I noticed in the newspapers that uh, Toronto has already done an estimate of their folks on the waiting list at 13,000, which is not a huge number for a city the size of Toronto. And I know we're or reorganizing our lists. Do we have any approximate numbers as to how many legitimate folks are still on those lists? My apologies. Uh, through the chair, Councillor Parrish, can you repeat the question? Yeah, Are we sure. Okay, we're uh, referring to the Canada-Ontario housing benefit? Correct. Okay. And all I'm looking at, I, the report is great, I'm looking at the fact that Toronto has already got a firm estimate of 13,000 people on their wait list. I know we are currently upgrading ours and making it more efficient. I'm just wondering if we're at the stage where we can guesstimate how many people we would have on our list. Um, I don't have an update on the wait list at this time. We did begin our census work in December, so I should be able to come back to you shortly with that information. That would be terrific. Thank you very much. And Thank I'll move the report. Thank you. Councillor Ross. Uh, thank you very much. And I just want to make sure we're on the set. This is 14.2 we're on, right? No. We're on 12.3. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. I'll wait. Okay, so uh, as I see, there's no direction required. Uh, I give it back to you, to the chair. Thank you, and that moves us on to item 13, items related to planning. Chair Pileshi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members of council, you have before you items related to planning and growth management. Item 14.2, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing letter dated December 19th regarding the changes to the Development Act made by more homes, more choices. I believe that it could have been Councillor Raz, probably Councillor Parrish, but Councillor Starr is the first one on my list. Councillor Starr. Yeah, I guess what I'm looking for is clarification in the letter uh, because it's contradictory. And uh, what, what, what the overall program is trying to do is to set up a plan that makes uh, housing cheaper and if you read it through the, just through the comments that were made in the letter and, and um, the changes that the rate would be frozen for two years and then they could pay the development charges over a period of time. However, uh, it says we recognize municipalities may have some additional costs and then they can charge whatever maximum interest they want. So if I'm a developer, let's think this through. If I'm a developer borrowing money at four, five, six percent, and then the municipality wants to charge, for instance, at its tax rate of 15%, I, as a developer, is going to say, just a minute now, this delta doesn't work. So therefore, why am I building cheaper housing? So somebody at the province has not thought, thought this through. And I don't know if you folks picked this up or not from, from the regional part of it, but it's, it's contradictory. And, and, uh, and I, it won't take long for the people in the outside world to figure this out and say, you know, this doesn't work for us. So I, uh, any comments? Stephen, can you comment on the contradiction coming out of the province? <laughs> I won't comment on the contradiction coming out of the province, but certainly we are um, working with the local municipalities. Um, the province didn't set any cap on rates um, and certainly doing a punitive rate wouldn't be helpful for affordable housing. But we are intending to bring a report to council either at the next meeting or in early February as we're working with legal or municipal peers across the province and the local municipalities in terms of what does this look like in terms of how do we protect the financial sustainability of the growth program while respecting the need for increasing the supply of affordable housing. So that there will be a full report coming to council on this. 
Well, I, I, I have to agree that the, the devil's in the details here, and if we don't address it at this point, and if we don't have, if the municipality, uh, realistically, uh, if the money costs uh, the municipality uh, three, four, five percent, whatever it costs there, then that should be a reasonable amount that should be passed on. And to, to say there's no maximum, and then to have the finance department come in and say, well, we charge 15% on overdue taxes, so that's a good, that's a good number. Uh, that's not going to work. So I, I, I certainly hope that's addressed, because I think we always say that the, the province comes out with these great ideas. Devil's in the details, and we have to work out or find out how to work this system to the best way possible. So, Steve, I'll leave it in your hands, but I mean, I, 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 I'm sure that a lot of us uh, probably think the same way. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to work. And we want housing, we want the, this type of housing to be affordable. We want it to be where, you know, it's, it's something of an incentive for the developer, not a de-incentive. Thank you, Councillor Starr. <laughs> By your silence, I think you're agreeing. <laughs> we, we will certainly bring forward all of those options, and certainly we're not intending to bring in any for, anything forward that would be punitive, but really reflect the, the inflationary costs of our growth program. Uh, which is covered by indexing today, which is no longer covered by indexing. Um, so that's sort of the avenue that we're looking at. I think the intent from the province is more to provide certainty to the development community. So protecting against the future rate increase, you may recall in 2012 our development charge rates went up 100% and in 2015 it was about 20%. So it's really protecting against those types of incremental increases and give that development community that kind of a certainty. But that'll all be captured in the report. And that'll be captured in the report. Thank yes. you. Councillor Ross. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I do look forward to the report coming forward. I had similar lines of questioning, um, certainly in terms of what the impacts were going to be for some of those additional uh, costs. Um, but the ballpark of what those costs will be. But I, I'm assuming we don't there's going to be a lot of hypotheticals. We're not going to know what the costs are uh, because it's only based on the applications that would apply for those deferrals, correct? That would be correct. Okay. Um, and previously, we weren't, um, as, a municip or as municipalities, allowed to charge interest rates that were considered um, egregious uh, or, through, or exorbitant. Yeah, through the chair, the... We didn't charge interest at all. What we did is on February 1st and August 1st, we would index it to the construction index, so reflecting our actual cost increases from the time that the bylaw was approved and every twice a year we would increase based on uh, construction index to reflect the cost. And that's all we're looking at if we put in, re recommend an interest charge uh, for council would be to make sure that our costs are actually recovered. Okay, and as we, uh, I guess, work through this new process of uh, deferrals, are we having and engaging in any discussions with some of those um, companies or organizations that would potentially uh, partake in a deferral program? Uh, through the chair, the deferral program applies to all applicants. Um, so certainly our affordable housing program, in their discussions on affordable housing supply, will have conversations. But at the end of the day, the deferral program is, is across the board. If you put forward an application, you qualify automatically. There's no, it's it's not just affordable? It's mandatory on the affordable housing, the not-for-profit rental and purpose-built rentals. Okay, but it's not for a typical you know, condo in downtown yeah. Mississauga, say? Would okay. not. Perfect. Thank you. I look forward to the report. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Councillor Parrish. Yes, I do too, because initially when you look at it, it, it seems like it would incentivize developers to put a certain percentage of affordable housing even in a condo that they're building in downtown Mississauga. So I don't know how you would go about um, letting them delay DCs if 10% of the building is affordable and the rest is not. So that's one you might want to look at. Um, when you're doing your report. Um, there are also large costs. Our staff has said to us, <coughs> administering this when you get to pay in eight, eight drops is very expensive, very time consuming and prone to error. Um, the other thing um, too that concerns me is, is the rule of thumb still correct that we're really only achieving 75% of our costs through DCs? Uh, through the chair, it's probably in that range. It's certainly, with the latest changes, it's a little bit lower, but it's in that roughly that range. That's certainly what the independent uh, consultants have advised. 
So even if we decided that 5% was a reasonable rate instead of 15%, it's still not going to cover. We're going to be losing ground as all these payments take years to, to collect to the end. We're still putting the pipes in. We're still putting the roads in. We're still putting the money up front. So the longer it takes them to pay this back, the better uh, for them and worse for us, correct? Certainly on... on on the rental properties, it allows them to match their expenditure streams better with their rent streams, so it smooths it out for proponents to build uh, purpose-built rentals. Um, the property taxpayer pays the difference in terms of that 25% that we lose, so growth doesn't, doesn't cover the cost of growth when it comes to development charges. And, and spreading out the DC payments just makes it worse. It will be an administrative burden, and it'll affect um, the timing and future requirements for debt issuance because we're putting the pipes in the ground 20 or 30 years before uh, development sometimes happens, and then now we're going to have a deferral program for the next 20 years on top of that. So we will be borrowing money longer for this program, so there's greater risk on the debt side, for sure. Okay. I, I, too, am looking forward to this report. I think it's going to be mind-boggling, and the province is not... They've shown us they're not a, adverse to waking up and saying, wait a minute, this isn't working. And maybe we can uh, talk to some of the organizations like AMO and the rest and see if we can get them to take a second look at this as well. I'd much rather just get a straight grant from them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Our next item is 14.3, another correspondence from uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, email dated uh, December 20th regarding changes to the Ontario uh, provincially significant employment zone mapping. Uh, Councillor Groves will go to. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, I guess, to staff, um, I, I do have some questions on this, and as you know, my community is, was actually quite shocked to see this, and so was I. So in the first paragraph, I know it says um, that there was a request for changes. Um, I don't recall seeing any request for changes, so is it possible for us to get that request in, in writing, whatever that request was? Get a written a copy of the written request. So um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the requests from the ministry around the provincially significant employment zones were, were embedded in their consultation on the 2019 growth plan. So council may recall it was a while ago, it was back in the, in the beginning of last year when in, uh, in uh, providing uh, comments back to the province on some of the planning initiatives, the 2019 <coughs> growth plan, we did report um, on, uh, on the, the proposed provincially significant employment zones at that time and received direction from council. We had some preliminary comments at council and received direction to engage directly with our local municipal partners and provide a submission uh, to the province at that time on, uh, on, on those zones and that was posted on our website and, and what have you. So that is available, we can provide that for sure. And then this, uh, this letter is, um, is a, is a uh, uh, I guess a, a response that the ministry has provided to comments that came um, both at the time of the original uh, growth plan and then, uh, and then further comments that they received over the fall from municipalities and, and from private, private landowners. So we have some of that that we provided, but the private ones we don't necessarily have. Okay, well, I would like to see that. And I, and I, I only saw a map, the map, the latest map that came out. So was there a map before that? Because apparently in the letter there was, earlier there was... Um, or was it January 15th, um, May 2000, uh, and in May 2019. So was there a map prior to this one that we just saw? Uh, so through Mr. Chair, yes, there, there was a map uh, from the Janu at the January 2019 timeframe, there was a map published, and that's where the comments that have been provided have been provided in response to that, and now this is the, the, the follow-up map. And... Uh, we can. Uh, we have prepared a bit of a comparison map that we could circulate around. Yeah, show I, the pre I would the like previous map and the current map from the province. I would like to see both maps. I'd like to see the one that was provided earlier and the current map. And uh, you, you're referencing the, uh, the the Bolton area, and that was one of the significant changes that was made from the original 29, uh, January map to the December map. Yep, I'd like to see that, please. Um, 
and uh, moving further down, following a review from municipalities, the updating mapping. Um, did you have a written request from Caledon? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, we uh, we collaborated with Caledon, and uh, the the region provided a response to uh, to the ministry, and I believe Caledon did as well. And we collaborated and had the the uh, basically the same requests. And in the written request was um, the current mapping where it's showing um, the lands in Bolton. Was that part of the request? So there was both uh, the town and the region did have a request in Bolton to incorporate um, the employment uh, uh, designation, the Ropa 28 lands that that uh, that are currently in force in, in the region's plan, in the Caledon plan. The ministry had left that out and we'd requested that to be put in. Uh, what we see in what the ministry has provided goes beyond that in, in Bolton and includes additional lands beyond what either the town or, or the region Regional staff had requested. Yeah, because it's my understanding, Roper 28 lands, those are the Coleraine West lands That's that right. were approved. So I, I don't recall any conversation, any discussion, and I'm not sure how the minister determined and through what process he determined that that should go a step further than what was approved in Roper 28. So <coughs> I'd like to get some answers on that because I don't have the answers. My community is not happy about it because as far as we knew, it was the Coleraine Westlands that we were dealing with with respect to employment lands. Um, and the other thing that I, I, there was public consultation. I have a lot of businesses in my area, and I've been saying this for all the years that I've been sitting here, that I, I have our business community that's struggling. And here they are, many, many years later, it's gotten worse. You know, the, the, the joke in Bolton really is when a business comes in is they say, well, let's see how long it takes for them to close their doors and move out. So who did they consult with? And who did the ministry consult with? So the ministry um, uh, consulted with municipalities, and uh, they they had uh, a, f a fairly um, in informal uh, um, public publicization publication uh, out out there to receive landowner requests. And I understand they did receive a number of landowner requests in Peel, uh, but we were not uh, not privy to, uh, to to what those submissions were. Okay. Well. <clears throat> I need to understand this because I'm, I'm a little confused. I don't understand how the minister on his own can determine moving those employment boundaries uh, further than what we approved here at the Region Appeal. So I, I need to see some, all the written information. I need to see those mappings, the current and the previous, because I, I don't know who he consulted with. Certainly, I'm a, I'm a local councillor there. I would think that there, I would have some input or I would have some information that this is the direction he was moving in. So I think councillor Groves, and <clears throat> typically, I think any time that we're dealing with the province in public consultation, this is always reoccurring. We don't ever know exactly where the public consultation went and why we weren't being informed if they don't go the way that we want them to go. I think some of the questions may be answered uh, by regional staff, but I think more of your questions need to go to your uh, member of provincial parliament for the area. Yeah, and thank you, Councillor Pileshi, but I, I really think that when you're talking about going into a municipality, changing zonings, changing all of this, they need to consult with the community. I, like, I mean, it's just, it's very draconian to me and it's very um, undemocratic to me anyway because I knew nothing about this. The only thing that we ever discussed was the Coleraine Westlands and that was all that I knew. So when I was very shocked to see this mapping, the latest mapping, and so was uh, the community of Bolton. So, you know, Councillor Perleshi, it's unfortunate because when you're making a decision that's going to impact a local municipality, I would think that the right thing to do is to engage those folks who are involved and active in the local municipality, not come out with something and say, oh, here it is, and then what? Sometimes it's a little too late to change it or it takes huge political will to change it. And I, 
I just don't know where this came from. It just came right out of the blue because I, I, I don't recall any conversations around it. So I'm sorry, I'm venting, but I will tell you my community is very, very upset about this. And so am I as a local councillor and so is our, our other, my colleague, uh, Council Rosa. We're both very shocked to see this. So I will look forward to the information that you're going to provide, Adrian. So I think um, staff will provide what we can provide, um, and it's it's the same thing. Councillor Gross, thank you for your yeah, passion. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Yeah, I found this quite quite fascinating as well, because I did go to the trouble of getting the two maps, and there's only two spots in all the GTA where they made any changes, and one was in Bolton, and the other was a piece in Mississauga, which is justified. But the Bolton one, when you get these two maps, you see that's the only place it was done. If they're taking input from um, the public, I would be sure there's a lineup of uh, 22 developers that would have all put in a request to expand that area up in Bolton or turn it into um, an, an employment area. What I'm not clear on, and I'd like staff to explain to me, is in the first paragraph, or second paragraph, it says, it gives municipalities an enhanced flexibility <coughs> to change the use of land so you can put uh, mixed use into areas that are provincially significant employment zones. Then in the next paragraph, it said, in the proposed mapping and clarified, provincially significant employment zones can include mixed use areas and do not change existing zones. And then in another location, it says you have to go to the province to do those changes now. Which is it? Can you take a significant employment zone and according to the municipality and the people around this table decide to put housing in there and some plazas? Does that qualify or do you have to go now through the province to do that? So I think before you answer that question, if you could maybe now provide a little bit of feedback on um, <clears throat> have we had an opportunity to talk to the province about this letter? It was just received. Um, so do we have an actual uh, understanding of a lot of the wording and a lot of the, the questions that are coming out of councillors? Um, so uh, through Mr. Chair, we've, uh, we've reached out to the province but haven't yet had, had those discussions. Uh, we, are, we, ha we do have direction from council to report back on our employment policies uh, in the coming months and the, uh, that's the policy work that we're doing to support our ongoing official plan review and the municipal comprehensive review. So we are, we are working away at, at that and when we bring that forward, the whole um, way in which we're responding to this new provincially significant employment zone policy framework will, will be incorporated in, in that. But just to explain a little bit about, about <coughs> some of the, the, the language in the, in the, the province's, uh, province's letter. Um, they, uh, the, the, the definition of a provincially significant employment zone does include both employment areas where conversions are required and, and you're familiar with, with the process around that and as part of the municipal comprehensive review. But they have recognized that, uh, that some of these provincially uh, significant employment zones will include other areas, adjacent areas that are uh, a part of the whole uh, employment complex and the, and the complex nature of employment in some of those areas might include mixed use and, and be outside of actually designated employment areas that require conversions. Okay. Uh, so some of that is what they're getting at in, in this uh, in this But commentary. the short answer, it says now that this has been changed, it will require provincial approval for employment area conversions within the zone. So the short answer is it's making it more difficult to put housing in a designated area. That's correct. Thank you. In the first paragraph, I'd like to ask the chair, uh, you seem to get a special shout out. Uh, I would like to thank you for your interest in the zones and your, your request for changes. Were you requesting on anything specific? Did you put a submission in? Mr. No, and chair, I picked up on like not at all. <laughs> Never spoke to anybody, no correspondence from me whatsoever, but I think they're speaking to the resolution that we had here with regards to trying to resolve the outstanding issues with regards to Brez. I think that's what that's a reference to. Okay, good. Um, it also talks about extensive staff input. So uh, um, Councillor Groves has asked you for any input from staff to the province, so I assume that will be coming forward in your report? Yes, we can provide that for sure. And a question to Patrick, if I might. Um, is this, if, if we actually... Um, the province is actually a party to ROPA 30 OMB. 
are they not in a conflict going in and messing around in that area when they are actually in that uh, OMB hearing? <laughs> He's slowly pushing his button. <laughs> I always ask these questions. <coughs> um, at one level, they are. Uh, however, they are exercising their own statutory authority with respect to putting provincially significant employment zones in into place and they and they can't be sort of fettered in doing that simply because they are participating in a hearing. So it's the left hand and the right hand. The right hand is in the hearing and the left hand is messing around. One authority trumps the restrictions that would apply uh, to the other. Okay. Um, I would suggest uh, that we request the ministry come and send a couple of their folks to walk us through this and explain exactly what's going on here because they did it with the highway. They, we, they came out and they explained that to us. So I would like to make the request <coughs> through the chair to have them come out and answer our questions. And I would also suggest to you, Councillor Groves, that you do an FOI on all their materials uh, because I would bet there's probably a 22 or 30, uh, some of the landowners up there and some of the developers that want to get in up there uh, they probably loaded letters in there, so I would do an FOI on that if I were in your shoes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. I'd refer to the clerk and maybe request that when they came and explained the GTA West corridor, was that, did that come out of regional council? Did we request that they come and do that? And if we did, was that by way of motion? I'll take that. If you can, Catherine, because at the time, you, I th believe you were the clerk. Yeah, I don't think that it was an actual request that we made to them to come. We have had ongoing meetings with them, mm -hmm. and it was a, a mutual, it would be helpful to come and, and present to council, but there wasn't a council resolution requesting specifically that they come out, but there has been ongoing work with them, and uh, together... Um, agree that they would come out to delegate. So the comments being made by Councillor Parrish, I'm getting the sense that if there was a motion that was put forward to request the province to come and explain this to members or to maybe a committee, um, I think that would uh, carry a little bit more weight than just saying, hey, Mr. Chair, can you Annette and I are happy to move the motion, to? Mr. Chair. Yes, okay. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Councillor Sinclair. Yes, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Adrian Smith. I'm wondering what the status of the uh, updated mapping is. Is that uh, now in a provincial plan and takes precedent over all other land use changes underneath that mapping? Uh, th through you, Mr. Chair, um, it, it is now in effect as a, in a, uh, a regulation that's, that's uh, a ministry approved mapping that is implemented through the growth plan. One of the, uh, one of the challenges with this particular issue is that the, the ministry is approaching these provincially significant employment zones in, th in three phases. The first phase was that initial mapping in, in January last year. This mapping now is kind of the, the second phase, and, and the third phase is to, is to further advance kind of the policy and implementation framework. So we don't know exactly how, how the province really intends to, uh, to, to fully implement it. But certainly um, uh, from, from our perspective, uh, we're gonna, we'll be continuing through our planning process in terms of identifying our underlying sort of uh, regional, regional planning framework, employment areas, and other land uses uh, underneath what is essentially a, a, a uh, an overlay with the provincially significant employment zone policy. Okay, so we don't know yet. All right. <laughs> and uh, I guess there's this uh, phrase uh, that they proposed mapping clarified that provincially significant employment zones can include mixed-use areas and do not change existing zoning. Is that really a clumsy way of saying Yep, there's all kinds of farms and residential and other land uses in these zones, and uh, but they're now non-conforming uses and are expected to go away. Is that an interpretation, or is because I'm struggling to understand what this means? Um, 
no, I don't think it means that those that those go away. It 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 means that the the policy framework where the uh, where the uh, province is in, is uh, encouraging um, employment opportunities uh, um, supersedes those those existing uses, but doesn't take away those existing municipal approvals. And these are the kinds of things that we are working through in terms of our own policies and, and understanding, and that uh, we would be including in that report that would be coming back later. Okay, good. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Just one other comment. Uh, I also found the, the letter to Mayor Thompson on the same form letter, and now Chair Anika seemed to be unusually chummy and could be open to misinterpretation. And uh, unusual. It's the odd, oddest letter I've seen from a provincial minister yet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sinclair. My list grows, and can I just remind uh, members that this is a, a communication letter. Um, we have, as staff, has not had an opportunity. We've reached out to the province, but we have not had an opportunity to uh, collaborate with the province to find out exactly what everything means at this time. With that being said, I go to Councillor Thompson. Thank you. So I'm asking for some clarification on a few things because we're all trying to get our heads around where we're going and we're going through some official plans both at our lower tier as well as our upper tier. When are we hoping to get details? I know they were saying like the first of the year. Is this going to be like the end of winter when we finally get something? Have they given you any inkling uh, when they're going to give us more details? And, uh, and on the questions I have is here's why. They've made that a designated employment area. But in Calgary, we're going through an official plan. So we want to grow Tullamore. We want to grow the Highway 10 corridor because uh, those are essential that, to make those areas grow as well. And does that mean that we have to, with the numbers that we get under the number scheme, does it mean that we have to fill up that Bolton area before we can expand to the Tullamore area or to the Highway 10 area? And I think that's something we need to get clarification on, or can you give us that? Um, because... There's other parts of Caledon that we need to bring the employment into as well. So th those are all questions that we're, we're uh, wondering about ourselves and exploring and we'll be exploring. Uh, the only indication we have is that, that that phase three work that the province is undertaking, um, that they would be initiating at the beginning of this year, but it's expected to take kind of several months to roll through and there'll be further consultation on it. So uh, although we'll hope to, uh, to engage with the province in short order, that whole phase three policy development and implementation approach is likely to take several months for them to work through. Well, I think with the timeliness, we had the uh, lawyer here in for the ROPA 30 last meeting. It almost need, uh, he was premature almost because about two days after he was here, the, the, or the day after he was here, things have changed. And I think for timeliness, especially for expenses that everybody's gonna pay, I think the sooner the better. Is there any way we can ask them, just knowing the significance of this, could we get, you know, could we get them to expedite, especially concerning uh, Caledon, Brampton, and uh, Peel on this? We'll certainly be expressing those same same messages to the staff. Yeah, yeah. for sure. No, no, thank you for that. And I know we're going to have a lengthy discussion about this on, on Tuesday at, at, at our council meeting as well and planning. But uh, no, there's just some things that we just needed to get clarification on. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councillor Russ. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just, Adrian, I just want you to keep in mind, there's so many, oh, this is so, I, they've just made this even more complicated. But uh, in the Clarkson area, we have the Clarkson Transit Area Study that's currently ongoing. And it's, uh, the province had suggested that if there's going to be um, uh, an expansion of housing or intensification around ghost stations where there should be, uh, then it's something that municipalities need to look at. And Clarkson in Mississauga was the first one chosen out of the gate. The, the challenge with that is um, part of the area has been um, deemed provincially significant employment lands. Um, so the going through these machinations, spending money on a lot of reports, uh, I just want to make sure that um, we keep in mind things that are currently underway and, and in the queue. Uh, I think intensification around GO stations um, is something that we all want to see. And uh, I don't want to throw all the good work that we've done uh, over the last year or so with, um, uh, you know, with our residents and with the, the city and our consultants um, uh, while this is 
so up in the air. So just something to keep in mind as we deal with the province on this, because I think we don't want to have a missed opportunity uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Groves. Thank you, and I think uh, Mayor Thompson raised a point that I was going to raise. Uh, Adrian, I, I recall a report that staff um, did where you were looking at future employment lands for Caledon, future residential lands for Caledon, for Bolton and Mayfield West. My recollection of that report was that, Mayor Thompson, you are correct, that future uh, employment lands for Caledon would be in the Tullamore area and over by the Highway 410 area, which makes sense. There is a highway there, so if you're going to put employment lands, you're going to put it where the highway is already in existence. So I, so I guess my question is, does the province have, do they have, do they not have any regard for what we're doing? We've spent a lot of time, we've spent a lot of money um, coming up with these uh, recommendations and, and, and that. And I recall when the GTA West Quarter, they were starting that, that um, looking at it years ago, not the second time, but years ago. One of the things that they said to us was they would work with municipalities. We should go ahead, do our planning, and they will work with us. Well, when I looked at what they came up with in the GTA West Quarter, uh, it didn't reflect them working with us whatsoever. And now we have this, and this doesn't reflect them working with us at all. In fact, it's contrary to what the region has said it's contrary to what Caledon has done through its BREZ process because through its BREZ process, there was never any identification or not that I recall, or conversation or discussion with council about those lands that the province has gone in and made these PZs or whatever they're called. Um, so I. I'm just dumbfounded, and I'm disappointed, and I'm really annoyed because my community is up in arms right now. Bolton has been struggling. We are now the trucking capital of Ontario because everything that other communities don't want, let's just dump it into Bolton because municipalities don't want these trucking companies, so let's just stick them over here in Bolton. So I, I'm looking forward to you coming back with a, a full report. I'm looking forward to the presentation from the province to explain how they arrived at this and the fact that they weren't working with you or with Caledon and, for, and to just come in here and do this. I'm sorry, but I, I find it really disrespectful and but I guess they have the power and the authority. Thank you, Councillor Groves. Really, really good question. I don't think staff should answer the question, but okay, all right. I know, thank you. Um, I was hoping you were gonna talk about uh, what you had said about the timeline or is that gonna be captured in the motion? Thank you. Councillor Innes, my last speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And since it is my ward, thank you for affording me that opportunity. Um, so I think that we're all struggling to understand. Uh, the letter is quite vague, and that seems to be the theme from the province. The last few letters that we received have been uh, sort of in this way. Um, and looking from the letter that uh, Chair Nika received and comparing it to the letter that uh, um, Mayor Thompson received, it's a form response. They say the exact same thing. Um, and I'm presuming that uh, those comments are based on the comments that we provided as a region and, and as the town of Caledon um, to the 2019 growth plan. Um, and it's not completely contradictory to what we requested because they did include what we did request, which was the Ropa 28 lands, correct? Right. They just expanded beyond that even more. So um, I guess I'm, I'm looking forward to not just inviting um, MMH representatives to come and delegate to us here today, but I'm looking forward to a fulsome report from staff. I think that the timing um, needs to coincide with when that delegation is actually coming here. Um, and that's going to require a lot of communication back and forth between our staff and uh, here and, and at the province. Um, one of the things that I would request that be included in the report 
is um, A, where we are with our employment needs for the region of Peel to meet our 2031 targets. Just a refresh, I know that we had that conversation about two years ago, I think, about where we were in reaching our residential versus our employment um, requirements under the growth plan that we had set for 2031. So I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see, uh, to meet the 2041 proposed suggestions, what sort of land um, is going to be required and where these provincially significant employment lands fall within the 2031 to the 2041 and that process. Um, it's, it's, I think it's all very confusing and I think that that would help clarify some things for me, especially because it is the area that I represent. And following that, um, when we do have MMH come and, uh, and have your report, I think that it's very timely and very cost effective if we also request the solicitor, the external solicitor that is responsible for representing the region of Peel in the Brez LPAT hearing uh, to be here because I think that we are going to need to have an in-camera discussion regarding that matter as well. So I will, I will put that out on the table and, um, and leave that with staff. I don't think that that has to be part of the uh, motion, but direction, I think it's something that we are all going to have to have a, a discussion about. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ennis. It has been captured in the motion um, as written before me. Um, there is no timeline, but we'll, I'll read the motion out first, and I think a timeline may be a little bit tricky because we'll need staff's uh, help on that report uh, when it's going to be coming back to Council. So it says that the communication from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing listed on as item 14.3 on the January 9th, 2020 Regional Council agenda be referred to staff for a report back to a future meeting of Regional Council and further that a staff, that staff from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing be requested to attend a Regional Council meeting to present on the employment zone mapping as soon as possible. So I've heard comments that I think it's a benef beneficial for members to have that report before us, um, at least uh, come before us when we have uh, members from uh, the Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, here to delegate. So can we leave it as that and then staff will work with, work with uh, housing to determine when that report can come back and when they can come and delegate to us? Mm -hmm. We're good. That's been moved by Councillor Pear, seconded by Councillor Groves. All in favor? that recorded vote. Carries, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you and well done. That brings us to item 15, items related to enterprise programs and services. Chair Fonseca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, item 15.4, options <coughs> to maintain Mississauga's vote during a member's absence. This is a for information item. It was held by Councillor Parrish. Councillor Parrish. Yes, uh, I would like to defer this to the next uh, regional council meeting. Uh, both mayors are absent, yeah. and it's significant that they didn't agree with each other on this. So <laughs> I think we'd like to, an opportunity to have a, a, a good debate on Absolutely. this. Absolutely. That's So I move uh, deferral. That's fine. Uh, do we need to record that? Or just direction? Direction? So just raise of hands, all in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. And item 16.1 is communications item by Councillor Parrish. Yes, I'd like to delete the, the resignation from ROPA 30 Appeals Oversight Committee. That was, a, as I said, a breakaway on my staff. Um, okay. And I, I really want to apologize to Council. Um, I took on more than I can handle, as you know. 25% of the geographical area of Mississauga happens to be in Ward 5. And foolishly, I've taken on some really huge projects this year. So I'm not leaving because I don't enjoy the committees. I'm uh, leaving because I just can't handle it. Never thought I'd ever say that out loud. Thank you. Okay. Uh so we do have a motion. Can we get it on the board or the motion is, there we go. So we need a mover and a seconder for this at the resignation of Councillor Parrish from the Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee and the Health Systems Integration Committee be received and further that a councillor be appointed to each of the two committees. So we can have a mover, Councillor Fortini and Councillor Groves. Can, can we, sorry, through the chair to the chair, can we attempt to fill in those two blanks right yes. now to deal with all aspects of it? 
through you to the chair of Council yeah. Fonseca. Anyone wanting to put their name forward for these two committees? Yes, it does have to be from Mississauga. I'll nominate <laughs> Councillor DeMerla. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor DeMerla and Councillor Sato. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, she's already she's already on health integration. Um, well, I, I I will, but I don't really want to nominate myself. I'll sit on strategic housing and homelessness. I'm already on his sick, so perhaps we could put Councillor Demerla on <laughs> his sick. Councillor Pileshi has <laughs> nominated. Councilor Demerla, she will have to say, yeah, looking to clerks, she will. Okay, so from a pro procedural standpoint, can we put this forward and then see what happens? Okay, great. So this is a um, recorded vote. Thank you very much. All right, back to you, I believe. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. and uh, just for clarity through the clerk, I believe everything related to public works has been dealt with. 17-1, the Heritage House, Mayor Thompson's yes. letter, 18-1. So that takes me down to other business. Councillor Dasko. Thank you, and through the Chair, I just had a, a quick question just with regards to the Christmas tree collection program. This year, I, uh, I I heard it from some of those that were of the Orthodox faith last year that uh, the tree pickup for real uh, live Christmas tree pickup was early and it, uh, it, it kind of circumvented some of that, uh, had some issues down in my ward. And then this year, it just seems a little bit late. Uh, and I've, I've already had uh, people complaining, they've put their Christmas trees out, et cetera. And I see the, the, the schedule is, I guess, the 13th to the 20th. Some odd, and I'm just wondering logistics on that. Just I, I need to go back to give some residents some answers. To the chair, I'll be brutally honest. I don't know the answer to why we changed the date or why it's. I can get you a good answer though. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Under other business, Councillor Parrish. Yes. Yes. Um, I know at some points we have to get reports late. Uh, we got too late yesterday afternoon. When they are late like that, sometimes we don't pick them up, those of us who work with paper. Would it be possible to have those reports put in these folders in the morning so when we come in, we know we've missed it last yesterday at the office? I didn't, I didn't, I'm speaking on generally because sometimes that happens at my office. Comes in around 4.30 and even my staff is gone. So if we could just have those put in this folder the next morning, when you know it, it went in late on Wednesday, is that possible? <coughs> Thank you. And and, a very good suggestion. And the second point, I don't need the in-camera thing I thought I needed. Thank you, Councillor Parrish, which brings us down to Councillor Rass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question. On our pr uh, in the previous uh, council, we had a line item on our council agenda about inquiries from councillors. And that has since dropped off. I'm just wondering if for other business, we could have other business slash inquiries from councillors. Um, I think that, that was always an issue that it wasn't specifically spelled out. Uh, through to Catherine Lockyer. We had in, um, public inquiries or, or public announcements. We, we didn't have inquiries from councillors in the past. It was from public announcements, which we got rid of. It wasn't actually used. It was to um, augment delegations, and it was more around um, presentations or, or, or councillors that wanted to make uh, announcements about something that was happening in the community. And it was never used as it was intended. Brampton has that. Um, on their agendas, and at the time that we redid the procedure bylaw last term, it was suggested by the Bam Brampton councillors to include that at the regional um, agenda, and then it was never really used here. Um, but we could be open to adding something to the other business to give councillors a chance to make councillor inquiries. And I would think through the chair, your point's very well made. I think the simple solution is 
other business and inquiries, because what Councillor Dasco just did is a simple inquiry, and it is other business as well. So would that satisfy everybody, I think? So from now on, other business will read other business and inquiries yeah. through to Catherine? As, as long as we have a clear expectation that there shouldn't be any motions that come out of those inquiries yes. at that time, because staff wouldn't have had an opportunity to be either prepared or to pr potentially have the yes. answers. So as long as there's that, that expectation. Okay. Uh, do I need a motion, direction? That's taken as direction, Madam Clerk. Very good. Okay, well done. With that, that deals with all the other business. Uh, notices of motion. Do I have any? Seeing none. Bylaws. Uh, moved by Councillor Madero, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, that the bylaws listed on January 9, 2020, Regional Council agenda being bylaws 1, 2020, 3, 2020, and 4, 2020, be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed there too. All those in favour? Any opposed? That is carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Kovac, seconded by Councillor Groves, that the bylaw 5, 2020, to confirm the proceedings of Regional Council. Just a point of clarification. Um, when we dealt with taking Councillor Parrish's item out of in camera, that was by way of vote. Her direction is enough that we don't have to go back. Madam Clerk, you're satisfied? Yes, Very good. That being the case, we're properly constituted. Councillor Kovacs and Councillor Groves have moved the motion that bylaw 5 2020 to confirm the proceedings of Regional Council at its meeting held on January 9, 2020, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the Region Appeal bylaws relating thereto to be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. You've heard the motion. All those in favor? That is carried. And finally, as moved by Councillor Singh and Councillor Carlson, that the January 9, 2020 Regional Council meeting adjourn. All those in favour, carried and well done. Thank you to all. <laughs>